Listen only at this time, and those of you that were given the access code as participants can hear us and are able to respond. Hi, Ralph. It's Nancy Rickenbaugh. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Other folks that were registered to participate, just to confirm everyone. Hi there, Morgan. This is um. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Arianne. Okay. We'll do formal introductions momentarily. Just doing a quick, quick check Your there. Thank you. Exit and entry button beeps. This um, is Don from Klamath Health Partnership. Okay. Thank you, Don. Hold on, just a moment. Um, as long as you've got her set up to release the mute of the general line of the other participants, I worry we should be good. Okay. I just the, the beeps. Oh yeah. People Turn should be people should be called in by now. Okay. Great. So how do we Thank you, Michelle. Good morning. All right, here we go. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us at our first of 13 or so rules advisory committees tied to CCO 2.0. Um, welcome, REC participants and the general public with us both in the room and on the phone. Uh, good morning again. Thank you for joining us in person. Happy August 1st. Um, this is, as I said, the first of about 13 rules advisory committees that will convene during the month of August tied to CCO 2.0 and the new contracting cycle. Um, just as general context, and I think most all of you are familiar or have seen it, otherwise you would not be with us today. Um, lots of information posted on our RAC 2.0 website related to the rulemaking process, the upcoming calendar and topics and individual rules that will be discussed at that time. I will note that we did shut off registration for all racks at 5 p.m. yesterday as stated on our website, so hopefully folks did get their request in for representation there. Um, we do have a particularly large group with us today. Um, we've got a lot of participants on the phone as well, so we want to make sure that they have equal opportunity to participate as RAC members as those of you who did come to the building today. So process-wise, we'll do a little bit of that, provide an overview for context, and then get into the substance of it. I will, when we get into the discussion related to specific rules and I begin to see folks around the room raising their hand. I will also ask and I'll take account of who wishes to speak to address an issue. I will also pause and see if there are RAC participants on the phone that want to get into the queue on that specific topic as well. Um, we will take a break when there is a logical section break, probably 10, 15, 10, 30-ish in that neighborhood. At that time, we will also come off mute for the general public to see if there are people on the phone and in the room that wish to offer public comment at the end of the meeting. We will limit public comment to 10 minutes, and that 10 minutes will be divided equally amongst those that wish they do indicate to offer comment. Um, to that point, public comment today will be limited to the rules discussed at this RAC, not other rules or other issues. Those opportunities will be afforded when those RACs are discussed. A um, Couple other pieces, housekeeping and accessibility. If anyone needs restrooms are in the hallway directly behind us. And if I can ask everyone in the room to place your cell phones on mute or vibrate at this time, give everyone a chance just to do that double check. We thank you for that. Um, and a couple pieces around process. What I'd like to do actually first is go around the room and on the phone and take roll and have introductions of people here. State your name and the organization that you're representing today. Then we'll do a little more housekeeping and get into the substance. So if we can start to my left here. Oh. Hi, I'm Kim Steubenraug, and I am partnering with Ralph here um, to make these meetings happen and take care of all of you. I'm Bill Boschko with IHNCCO. Hi, Jesse Beeson. I use he, him, his partner with Northwest Health Foundation. Lucy Zamorelli with Trillium Community Health Plan. Stick Crosby, All Care CCO. I also use he, him, his pronouns. Marianne Blankenship with Pacific Source. Bob Estrajani, EML CCO. Colin Sanders, he, him, his pronouns, Brooklyn Cascade. Megan Clark, Recovery Services. Kimberly Coops, she, her pronouns, uh, representing the Alfred Choice Oregon Foundation. Tony Erickson, I represent Northwest Oregon Works and Northwest Regional ESD. 
Amanda Normine, Columbia County Hub. Tom Sensek, Healthcare for All Oregon. Carrie Trout, Salem Health, Salem Hospital. Emily Fanjoy, she, her pronouns, um, Tides of Change, formerly the Tillamook County Women's Resource Center, and the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Good morning, everyone. Zania Jeff here, she and her pronouns. I'm with the Oregon Health Equity Alliance. Hi, everyone. Laurel Swartlow, she, her pronouns. I'm with Planned Parenthood Advocates for Oregon. Deborah Riddick, I'm with the Oregon Nurses Association. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Deborah Riddick, okay. Oregon Thank Nurses Association. I'm Glenn Pearson, an advocate, and especially involved in com committees for transportation. Lorraine O'Brien. Oh, I'm sorry. Lorraine O'Brien, community member. I'm Jeremiah Rizvi. I, today I think of Care Oregon and Columbia Pacific and <laughs> Jackson Care Connect. Kristen Downey, Providence Health Plan, Providence Health and Services. Annette Mossman, OCHIN, and 211 Info. Will Clark Shim, OHA Actuarial Services. Chris DeMars, OHA Transformation Center. Amanda Peden, she, her pronouns, and OHA Transformation Center. Maria Castro, she, her pronouns, Equity and Inclusion Division, OHA. Thank you. Uh, I want to do a quick listen check for folks on the phone. We do have microphones set out throughout the room. Um, RAC participants, par by phone, before you introduce yourself, can I just hear, affirm that you all did hear everyone with ease, without challenge, um, particularly towards the end of the table at the room here. Otherwise, we'll pass a microphone down to make sure that their voices carry. So did you hear everyone? They were very light. Yes. It was difficult. OK, thank you for that. Um, sir, if you don't mind. Can you hear my voice? Yes, I can. Thank you. Hold on just a second. Right. Can we pass one of the mics down towards the end of the table, and we'll just share amongst us? All right. Always a fun at time to have people in a large meeting and the phone introduce themselves and all say their names at once. We'll see how that exercise goes this morning. Can I ask RAC participants on the phone one at a time to introduce themselves by name and organization? Very slowly. Very slowly. Okay. <laughs> Nancy Rickenbaugh, Willamette Valley. Thank you, Nancy. Erin Jolly, Washington County Public Health. Thank you, Marion. Don Wallace, Klamath Health Partnership. Thank you, Don. Carolyn Anderson. Thank you, Carolyn. Morgan Fuoco, OHSU, PSU School of Public Health and Kaiser Center for Health Research. Great, thank you, Morgan. Uh, and then it's here. Debbie Morrow, County Parent. Thank you, Debbie. Susan Bolt, Cascade Health Alliance. Thank you, Susan. I Beth Englander, Oregon Law Center. We were doing great until there. I did hear Beth Englander, who was the other from the Oregon Law Center. Who else? This is Ivy with Apano. Um, I use she, her pronoun. Thank you, Ivy. Anybody else? Shields with Lincoln County Health and Human Services. Thank you. Who's that? Shields. And your first name from Lincoln County, sorry? Nicole. Nicole, thank you. Lindsay Staley, Mosaic Medical. Thank you, Lindsay. Angelica Godinez from the Reinhardt Clinic. Thank you, Angelica. Casey Smith from Partnership and McDonald's. Community Living. Thank you, Casey, and the other person. Marion McDonald, North Central Public Health District. Thank you, Marion. All right, I'm thinking that is Debbie Thompson, Yellow Hawk Tribal Health Center, um, Pendleton, Oregon, representing the nine tribes of the state. Okay. Uh, John, John Curtis, Jackson Josephine County's Disability Services Advisory Council. All right, thank you. Sarah Franklin, Haven from Domestic and Sexual Violence. Thank you. All right, we, I think we had a couple. This is Sean Snyder from Project Access Now. Thank you, Sean. Um, hmm, I think we had. Hampton again, Yamhill CCO. Thank you. What was her name again? Your name from Yamhill, sorry. She's Nan Finnegan. 
Susan and Finnegan. All right, we had, a, I think, 41 folks tallied at 5 o'clock yesterday. So strangely, I think I've heard more than 41 names, but we are a party of inclusion, so we are going to do the best we can to get through all of this together. Um, and we did have a couple other folks uh, join in the room. Can I ask them to introduce themselves? Yeah, hi, I'm Robin Traver. I am the director of pharmacy for Umqua Health. Thank you. And did I see someone on this side? Keisha Dumas, Chair of Traditional Health Workers Commission. Keisha, thank you and welcome. All right. So folks in the room, folks that, oh, sorry, one more. Good morning. I'm Christine Hyen with the Oregon Department of Justice, Crime Victim and Survivor yep. Services Division. Great. Thank you, Christine. And did I hear one more person on the phone? All right. Uh, I, just wanted, I, just, I, didn't, I didn't say my last name. It cut off. Carolyn Anderson. Thank you, Carol. Got Carol Anderson. All right. So, RAC participants, those of you that did confirm by 5 p.m. yesterday, you did receive an email packet last evening. Going to run through quickly just some pieces about your participation in this process, and then we will hand off to our social determinants of health team to conduct the substance of this, this meeting. So this RAC's role is advisory and consensus is not necessary. Its goal is to seek public and stakeholder input to the maximum extent possible. We're here today to gather input and suggestions about the development of new rules, amending or repealing of existing rules, or the, and the fiscal impact. Today, we will be discussing a new rule, specifically the rule tied to social determinants of health and health equity. What to expect as a RAC member, um, focus on substantive changes and again this being a new rule everything is substantive today um, we'll lead discussion about the significant alteration of current rules um, and not specific to this rack but going forward worth noting that we will not be speaking to rules that have not had substantive revisions tied to them we will go into that a little bit more when the general rules advisory committees kick off um, for substantive changes, our social determinants of health team will lead us through conversation as to what those are, um, how to provide your comments and input. Obviously, we're a large group today, so we're going to do the very best we can. You know, ideally, it's less of us talking and you listening and largely us listening to you. That is why we are here together today. Um, to that point, knowing we have a lot of folks on the phone, myself or someone else in the room will repeat your question or comment to make sure that we are tracking it correctly and that those on the phone can follow you. Um, and very important piece, knowing and recognizing the duration of time we have together and the substance, RAC members will be able to submit written comments for additional follow-up to us the, the next seven days. So close of business next Thursday, the 8th of August. We will need those sent to the CCO 2.0 rulemaking inbox. Um, everyone else has noted on mute, as I said earlier, we will take you off mute during the brief break and identify who wishes to offer public comment at the end, as well as anyone in the back of the room. And next steps in this process, and this is very important, and speaking generally and broadly to the public, this is not your the only opportunity to provide comment for the rules themselves. This is the advisory committee to help inform us on what the final drafts will be that we will post on or about November 1st for an official public comment period that will run through November 18th with a public hearing, I believe, here in this building on November 15th. So short version of that is the outputs of this month of rules advisory committees during the months of September and into October. OHA will synthesize, digest, and review content and comments received and recommendations. We will do so in parallel with with processes related to the final CCO 2.0 contract. We are obviously striving to have strong alignment between rule and contract for CCO 2.0. So thus the need for us to put a box around the time limits associated with, sub with submitting public comment to each rule. To that point, the general public will have opportunity to participate and to offer comment, as I said, November 1st to November 18th. Um, very important. So I think that is it for the housekeeping piece. I'd like to welcome our social determinants of health team and specifically introduce Amanda Peden to start us off. Thank you, Ralph. Um, so thank you, everyone. And we will do our best to um, project well so you can all hear us. Um, 
just to give some brief context before we get started, um, the rulemaking that we're going to be going over today and then in the next um, couple of weeks uh, related to social determinants of health and health equity is directly related to the Oregon Health Policy Board's um, policies for CCO 2.0. So I think most are familiar, but the um, Oregon Health Policy Board um, over the last um, year and a half had conducted a process of um, developing um, with support from OHA a series of policies for CCO 2.0 under four governor priorities, um, the social determinants of health and health equity, value-based payment, behavioral health, and cost. And so again, um, today uh, we'll be reviewing, as Ralph said, this new rule related to um, implementing aspects of certain social determinants of health and health equity policies that are a result of the Oregon Health Policy Board work. Um, and just as a quick note that next um, Thursday, there's another relevant RAC on traditional health workers that are, rela that are related to aspects of those policies. And then on August 15th, this RAC will return um, uh, from one to four to discuss uh, policies related to community health assessments, community health improvement plans, and health-related services. Um, for the remainder of this meeting, um, we are going to be walking through the rule, and as Ralph said, it's all substantive changes because it's a new rule. Um, we are going to be jumping around um, in the rule rather than walking through step-by-step um, step just in order to group like themes so that we can have more of um, a discussion and, and um, more consistency for your feedback. Um, we um, are going to start with the definitions, but then we're going to skip past the adjusted net income definition um, and start with subparagraph 2B just to ground you. Amanda, can I interrupt yep. just a quick sec to do a listen check? I want to make sure that folks on the phone are hearing Amanda okay. If not, we'll ask her to hold the microphone. I can hear her fine. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Folks in the room, are you hearing me okay? Okay, um, and then uh, we, we will be reading the rule language directly. We'll provide a little bit of background and context, but again, like Ralph said, we really, the purpose of today is to hear from you, so we're going to try to limit our speaking as much as possible to really hear um, directly from you. Um, so with that said, we're going to, the purpose of the next several definitions that we'll start with, um, starting with subparagraph 2B, the definition of health disparities, Apologies again, Amanda. Can I ask and make sure that folks that are on the phone that are active participants, if you will stay on mute until you want to engage in the conversation or discussion, we're hearing some feedback of some kind. Thank you. Amanda? Thank you. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, we're supposed to be on mute. Uh, ideally, yes. We just don't want to pick up any ambient oh. noise that may be going on in your office or workplace, wherever um, in the room here. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. All right. So we'll start with the health disparities definition. Uh, the purpose of the next several definitions that we'll walk through is to really develop a common understanding of what we mean by social determinants of health and other related terms and to provide guideposts for the types of strategies, activities, and partnerships that are relevant for this work. So I'll pass it on to Maria Castro to start. So there is a definition of the health disparities that you can see in the rule, but there's also some information I wanted to share about the definition of health equity that uh, should be uh, appearing in the rule as well. The Health Equity Committee, who is a subcommittee of the Oregon Health Policy Board, is currently working on the development of a definition. And uh, we have had uh, the opportunity to receive feedback on this definition. Um, Feedback, uh, the due date was July 5th, but our meetings are public meetings, and the next meeting where we are actually going to be talking about health equity definition is on August 8th, um, and information is posted on the health equity committee um, page, if you're interested. And, um, and then the definition of health disparities that appears in the rule, and it states that health disparities are the structural health differences that adversely affect groups of people who systematically experience greater economic, social, or environmental obstacles to health based on their racial or ethnic group, religion, socioeconomic status, gender, age, or mental health, cognitive, sensory, or physical disability, sexual orientation or gender identity, geographic location, 
or other characteristics historically, historically linked to discrimination or inclusion. Health disparities are the metric used to measure progress towards achieving health equity. I think we're going to pause there and ask if people in the room or on the phone want to raise any issue, comment, or concern tied to the proposed definition. Yes, sir. I understand the concepts of good health care for all of us. Thank you. Okay. So um, I know geographic location is very important, but in this day of environmental issues, I'm wondering if it should be spelled out more clearly about access to clean air, water, uh, those kinds of items uh, and specific that may be related to geographic location. Okay. That we be more clear about that. Thank you, sir. So the general, gentleman from Healthcare for All Oregon, I'm paraphrased, please interrupt if I get this wrong. This is for the benefit of others in the phone, on, on the phone. Uh, concerned about this definition as it relates to people in geographic locations and the potential environmental impact of travel or transit? No, air, air, water, access to air, water, clean water, clean air, those kinds of things that have to do with your geographic location. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other feedback? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mary Ann like into the Pacific Source. Um, we just were looking for a little bit of clarification with regard to the final sentence, which notes health dis disparities are the metric uh, used to measure progress toward achieving health equity. And, and we understand and definitely support this, the intention behind that, but we're trying to clarify whether um, you're using that term in the sense that this will be something that CCOs are measured on, um, or whether it's more of a um, sort of a proxy for measuring progress toward um, achieving health equity. It, is it going to be, an, is there going to be a metric specifically created and tied to, um, to this definition by which CCOs are going to be measured? I think we're just looking for a little bit of clarification. There was some confusion um, among our Okay, so paraphrasing for folks on the phone, uh, the question was to clarify whether the term uh, will be used as a metric for measurement for CCOs or if there will be another proxy used. That... Yeah, really, whether it's a proxy for measuring just sort of broader progress toward achieving health equity over, okay. over you know, a longer period of time. Thank you. Um, before Maria responds, are there other individuals in the room or on the phone that want to pose questions? Yeah, this is Robin uh, on Qua Health. Uh, and some of these terms, if we could, for the CCO's sake, we can have them defined a bit better. Um, for example, improper allocation of expenses. Sure. If we can, Robin, I'm going to interrupt. I think we want to chunk these, and we're still talking about the one specific definition. Oh, health disparities? Yes. Okay. So, um, for so that one. yeah, go ahead. Okay. For that one, um, is there a method that OHA will use to define these members and the categories listed? Or uh, will the CCOs be held or be able to define or identify those members? Okay. What I'd like to do is I'm going to take, uh, we'll capture Stick Crosby's question. We will pause and identify anyone on the phone that wants to be in the queue for this. And then we will ask Maria and the team to respond. I would like to piggyback on that comment. Um, are these going to be the measures that are going to be collected? Will it be OHA doing the collection or the CCOs on the requirement? And how that's going to be, you know, how are you going to crosswalk both of those? Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anyone on the phone that wants to get in the queue related to this definition? Yep, yeah, Beth. Beth England? Beth um, from OFC, please. Yeah, All right, thanks. we'll come back to you, Beth. Anybody else? All right, Maria Elena. Uh, uh, oh, this is Sandy. I have a, uh, this is Sandy at Yellow October Health Center. Um, okay. <clears throat> I'd like, um, so Sa the Sandy, I'm, Sandy, I'm going to interrupt. Sandy, I'm going to interrupt. We're trying to All stay right. in order of folks that we will come back to you after Beth Englander, after we respond to these other pieces and questions. And then we'll have one other individual in the room as well. So do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, um, the decision to put the definitions in the rule is to be able to all um, share a common ground and understanding of things, not to um, ask for measurements. 
is that we are all going to be in the same page. And when we refer to health disparities, that's exactly what you're going to have in mind as defined in <coughs> All right. And let's come back. Stick, I, that sounds like it probably addressed your. It, it does. Um, it's just when we, some of these are so vague that folks might get tied up into them, I feel, such as geographic location, sort of piggyback built environment, things like that. So I just, some of it could be a little problematic in that you have this broad definition. And then if we're creating, you know, out of these definitions, we're then creating plans and things like that. Some of it can get lost and folks could get tied up in certain aspects of it. So. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I think we had, do we have anyone else in the room with me? Let me respect folks on the phone first, uh, then we'll come back to you and then Jeremiah. Um, I think Beth Englander. Thanks. Um, could you, could someone just ex, uh, explain a little bit, what, what do you mean by structural health differences um, as opposed to just health differences? What, what, what's your intention with that? Um, that modifier. I'm assuming that the intent of the author of the definition refers to structures that um, present a barrier for health. And we are talking about barriers such as um, racism, discrimination, and others. Amanda or Chris, do you want to jump in? I agree with Okay, yeah. great. All right, thank you, Beth. I think we had Sandy from Yellow Hawk, and then we'll come back to the two folks in the room here. Sandy, go ahead. Okay, uh, um, thank you. Um, so, you know, I was just uh, discussing Healthy People 2020 approach to um, the social determinants of health, and, you know, there's five key areas um, that is economic stability, education, social and community context, um, health and health care and neighbor and built environment. So when you look at social and physical, I hope that's what we are doing is when we move forward on this. I know we've done consultation with um, the Department of um, Oregon Health Authority. Um, all nine tribes had that opportunity to input, but I'm just curious when you start, you talk at a broader um, aspect of how you are going to define those um, criteria or metrics that they that the CCOs have to meet? I'm just wanting to make sure that's inclusive. Thank you. Is there a question? Or so I still take feedback. Thank yeah, you very sure. much, Sandy, for your feedback. Thank you, Sandy. Um, the woman towards the end of the table. Apologies, I don't know your name, and then we'll go to Jeremiah Rigsby. Emily Fanjoy, and I um, have a comment in regard to broad versus specific definitions of social determinants of health, and I'd like to um, suggest that we include definitions of personal safety in terms of intimate partner and sexual violence that impacts as much as half of the population of our state. Thank you, and for everyone on the phone, that was a comment slash recommendation slash request for inclusion of some definitions related to? Intimate partner and sexual violence. Intimate partner and sexual violence, thank you. Sure. Okay, okay, oh, I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry, we're gonna respect the process here, but I'm happy to take you after Jeremiah Rigsby. Who is this, ma'am? Okay. Okay, Jeremiah. Yeah, just a quick comment. I think um, in CCLA people get a little triggered when they see the word metric, but I think what you're trying to say, and tell me if I'm wrong, I think what you're trying to say in this last sentence is the reduction of health disparities is how we figure out whether or not we're achieving equity. And maybe just say that. As a because I think what that you, you don't you don't have a definition that's an exhaustive list. I think you want to include every, a lot of the things that people are saying. The definition, and people are going to really hone in on a definition if you're talking about achieving metrics that CCOs are at risk for. Um, and so I think you're right that reducing health disparities is how we can tell whether or not we're achieving our equity goals. Um, and you can say that in a way maybe that doesn't conflate the two things. Developing a metric, which I think is a year or two away um, for social determinant stuff, um, and that might be the share build conversation, um, versus we just want to make sure that we're reducing health disparities. So. 
Thank you. Let me come back to the one woman on the phone here, and then we will speak to these two individuals here that are requesting to speak, and then I am going to move us along in the interest of time, recognizing that everyone will have additional time during the next week to offer follow-up. So uh, on the phone, ma'am. Well, I was just wanting to point out that um, I think it's necessary to, okay, we're, 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 we're really too broad, but to narrow it, it brings it down to focus. I wanted to put uh, something uh, in relation to people uh, experiencing uh, hate. Uh, let's see. The social, I don't know how to say it. Uh, experience of hate and hate crimes from my uh, minorities, minorities experiencing, you know, the various hate issues. Oh, God, I should I'm sorry. No, not a problem. I think that was very well stated, and I think we all understand what you're saying. If I could just ask for your name. Yeah. My name is Carolyn Anderson, and I really do think it's important for us to really consider the fact that people, you know, minorities or, you know, LGBTQ uh, communities that experience hate and how that affects uh, the health of the person. Sure. No, I, Carolyn, we well, very much appreciate your comment and input there. Thank you. All right, uh, gentleman here, and then the woman next to him. Uh, names and organizations, please, and then we'll move along. Oh, I thought you did. I'm sorry. I'm Lucy with Trillium. Lucy Zamorelli. Um, I have a couple things. One is I'm not sure the last sentence belongs in this definition, so my recommendation would be to take it out. Um, I think it just it probably belongs somewhere else. The other thing is. I'm uncomfortable with the um, narrowness of the term mental health. Um, I think that, that perhaps there's some other way to say um, that behavioral wellness or uh, something that would include um, a broader uh, population, including substance users. Um, so that I'm uncomfortable with just that okay. narrowness. Thank you, Lucy, very much for that. Appreciate it. All right, I'm going to turn us back to the social determinants team here to move us along. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Ralph. Um, so the next two definitions um, relate to break down the term social determinants of health and equity, which is a term we use to describe um, the work under the new expectations that CCOs will have related to addressing community-based social factors as well as individual level social needs. And just to note that these definitions that follow um, have been in use throughout the CCO 2.0 policy development process and are a direct result of the work by the Medicaid Advisory Committee, Oregon's Medicaid Advisory Committee, in 2018 to develop shared definitions for CCOs. The two definitions, I'll just read them now, social determinants of health and equity. The social determinants of health refer to the social, economic, and environmental conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age. These conditions significantly impact length and quality of life and contribute to health inequities. Social determinants of health fall into the following domains, neighborhood and built environment, economic stability, education, and social and community health. The social determinants of equity refer to systemic or structural factors that shape the distribution of the social determinants of health and communities. And just to give an example of the social determinants of equity, um, institutional racism would be one example. So we'd like to ask for feedback on these definitions. Thank you. And let's just show by a show of hands in the room, and we'll capture who wants to speak, and then we'll capture likewise on the phone. And your name? Sorry. Maureen O'Brien. Laureen, hold on one quick second. Let me just go ahead and capture other folks if there are any, anyone else wish to speak or ask. Depending on her. Okay, uh, so we'll go first. Laureen O'Brien from? From community. From the community. From the community, thank you. And then Stick Crosby from All Care. Go ahead. Um, I, I just, uh, under those four buckets, I just wanted to know if the neighborhood and built environment was hard. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what we're trying to describe there. Um, but food insecurity, transportation, and housing, I assume, are under the economic stability. I, I, I wasn't sure where the, you know, how we're defining these. As most people think of social determinants of health, it's food, housing, insecure, it, and financial. Um, and then the, so that was one question. And the second one was just behavioral and mental health access. Where does, the, you know, where does that fit into the 
social determinants of health definition in the four buckets? Those are great questions, and um, I won't go into detail of all of everything that's included under the buckets, but um, the Medicaid Advisory Committee did also produce a much more detailed graphic that lists um, certain social determinants of health under these buckets. Um, that is available on the Medicaid Advisory Committee website um, and the full report um, with the definition, and will also be available in future guidance documents. Um, and you are correct that um, food insecurity and um, employment um, other examples of housing instability are included under um, economic stability. And then stick Crosby, and then we'll go to the phone. I'm going to submit mine in written. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone on the phone wishing to offer comment or feedback? Okay, what about gender and, and uh, race? Okay, and is this Carol? Help me again uh, with uh, first name and organization, please. Uh, my name is Carolyn Anderson. Thank you, Carolyn. And your comment or question again? Okay, uh, at some point, I'm not hearing uh, where we're talking about uh, gender inequality, like uh, LGBTQ and race. Okay, thank you. So I think the comment was recognition of different populations. Amanda, do you want to speak thank to you. that? Yes, um, thank you for that comment. Um, and question. The social and community health domain includes discrimination, which would include discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, culture, gender, disability, um, et cetera. And also the concept of social determinants of equity um, includes the structural um, barriers based on, um, on um, one's race or gender, et cetera. So racism, sexism, mm -hmm. ableism, et cetera. Thank you, Amanda. We're going to go to Bill Buska from IHN. One more individual at the back of the room here, and then we'll move along to the next piece. Uh, there was a definition of social determinants of health um, that was established in the statute under House Bill 3076 this past session. And I think we need to be really careful about having some definitions in statute and some in rule, and they may conflict. They, it, it'll get really confusing with this concept. So I would just encourage some consistency of definition and there's one in statute uh, there may be others but uh, we just it, it will get confusing if everybody's using different definitions for different purposes so I would encourage the statute definitions since it is in law <laughs> um, so anything, there was anything back I there think just to, to respond capture that, that we are capturing okay. um, statutory changes um, that have been made as of the end of the legislative session. So thank you for that comment. All right. Uh, actually, we're going to do two okay. more. Two more in the room at the end of the table, and then, uh, ma'am, I apologize with your name, but you first, please. Ellie Fanjoy, and um, my question is whether the social determinants built environment and the. I'm not sure what you're reading um, from based on the last comment, but also is inclusive of the, again, intimate partner and sexual violence experiences. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, the neighborhood and built environment includes crime and violence, including dom domestic violence. And yes. Yes, the board already ONA. I think mine is in response to the previous uh, identification that there might be two different definitions working. And it would certainly be our interest to go to the broadest, most inclusive definition and not to reduce it down to something. Um, because we're trying to raise our bar and the goals as opposed to limiting them because something else is not so that would be our Thank you for that. All right, I think we're going to move along to the next piece, Amanda, is that Yes, so okay. we will move now to the next definition, um, which is um, subparagraph D on social determinants of health and equity partner. Um, this clarifies um, the types of, um, the, uh, one of the key, one note is that the key principle of the policy development has been to actually recognize the role that community partners play as the true experts in social determinants of health and equity and um, the CCO's role in really working with and supporting these partners to address social factors impacting health. So this provision really defines the types of entities that are meant to be selected specifically to receive a portion of the CCO's social determinants of health and equity spending as required later in rule. Um, so the social determinants of health and equity partner means a community-based entity that delivers services or programs or supports policy and systems change or both to address the social determinants of health, and there's um, an error here, um, it should be the social determinants of health and equity, 
that the CCO has selected to receive a portion of the CCO's social determinants of health and equity spending. Any comments on that definition, feedback? I've got two in the room, um, and then we'll go to the phone. Uh, sir, let's go to you first. And I'm just curious, community-based, does that include cities and counties? <clears throat> Could counties perhaps be uh, working with this group and, and receive money? It doesn't, a community base tends to not include counties and local government, but I'm just wondering where local government fits. That's a great question, and I think um, you may be um, thinking about the term community-based organization, which, as you said, doesn't, is usually specific to a, a particular type of organization that is nonprofit and non-governmental. Um, and this is meant to be um, an inclusive def definition um, in how, at least in the intention um, of, this, of this drafting, so that it would include the various types of partners um, that are based in, a in the CCO's community that might be doing this work, and that might include um, uh, more entities like a local public health authority that would be Government well, that's what they intend. That is the intent. All right. Then this is not. That needs to be clarified. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Stick, before we go to you, let me do uh, roll on the phone. Are there people that will want to get into the queue on this one? Please just state your name. We will take Stick's question. We will come to you all. And then we have a gentleman in the back of the room here that wishes to speak. So on the phone, is there anyone that will want to get in the queue on this? Debbie Moore. Sure. Uh, one at a time. John Curtis. John Curtis. And who else did I hear? Debbie, Debbie last name? Morrow. 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 All right. Uh, we're going to take a question from Stick Crosby in the room, Debbie Morrow, and John Curtis, and then uh, two in the room. So, it's Stick. So, I, this is more of a concern in that I agree that it needs further clarification. So, with the way that I see this is worded, is it's, it's too broad to be social determinants of health. So, if you picked a housing partner, you could say that's your health equity partner, right? Or instead, it should be more, Are you? what is the need you're addressing within that housing partner with maybe language access or um, services for tribal individuals, whatever it may be that you're actually focusing in there, and not just that it's this broad piece. Because we've got two different levels here, right? One's the social determinants of health, and one is health equity. Thank you for that. Um, let's do uh, John Curtis and then Debbie on the phone, and then we'll come to the two gentlemen in the room. So, uh, John Curtis. Yeah, my concern is echoing um, the concern earlier raised about the definition of what a uh, an entity is, and I would, my concern is that loose-knit organizations of uh, consumers ought to be somehow uh, supported by the CCOs, especially if they are addressing those um, social determinants of health. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, let us go to Debbie on the phone. Just wanting to consider saying for community-based organizations, a nonprofit, a nonprofit community-based organization. So a request to include nonprofits in that definition. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the back of the room from Healthcare for All Oregonians. Health Tech Healthcare for All Oregon. Um, I think the definition with the additions, the comments make sense. I'm concerned about the idea of, and this may not be a place to resolve this, that the CCO chooses, especially because we're talking about policy and systems change. And those policies and systems change might sometimes, that people are advocating for, might conflict with what the CCO's direction is going. So there can be a potential here for the CCO to be selective based on something that fits that, that CCO versus what fits the community. Thank you, sir. Do you want to comment? Or? I think just to quickly say that um, I'm not sure it will address um, your concerns, but maybe later um, as we go through the rule, the provisions related to a community advisory committee um, in this Sorry. and others might, might help with that. All right. Uh, let's go to this gentleman first, and then we have got another request in the room. Sure. Uh, Jesse B. Singer, Press Health. Um, uh, addressing some of the concerns you raised, we've also had some conversations with CCOs about the ability to aggregate these funds given that systems change and population uh, policy change happens at different scales than just CCO geographies. So just being explicit that, uh, that a partner could include an aggregator of funds um, that uh, removes some of that uh, 
uh, perhaps CCO self-interest, but also allows the scale of policy change and systems change to be reflected. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and Christine. Christine from? Uh, Oregon Department of Justice. Oregon Department of Justice, go ahead. My question is, where are community-based entities defined? You said that they were defined and inclusive. Is it an inclusive definition? Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 meant to, I meant that the intent of this definition itself is to be inclusive of the many types of organizations. And so um, the community-based entity um, is the, the reason we put in um, the connection with the the services that that entity provides is to allow that inclusivity and to have it be tied more to the type of work they do rather than the type of entity. May I continue? Yeah. Yes, please. And, and this is no disrespect to your to your concern. Um, in our division, we look at community-based entities as specifically not governmental. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that if it is meant to be inclusive, inclusive of governments, then it actually makes the term confusing to me. Thank you. So I'm wondering if there's a way that you could if you want both of them to be included as potential partners, mm -hmm. could you define them distinctly? Thank you. And other individuals in the room are on the phone wishing. We've got one in the room, and then let me just do another check. Anyone else on the phone wishing to engage on this? Yes, I do. Um, this is Aaron from Washington County. Okay, Aaron, we're going to take the one in the room, and then you're up next, okay? Thank you. Sure. Carly Hood Ronick, um, Oregon Primary Care. May I ask if we can send the microphone your way? Thank you. Carly Ronan, Oregon Primary Care Association. Um, it's occurring to me in both kind of this definition of a community-based entity and actually the previous one as well that it, it appears there's a, a layer missing. Um, I appreciate the attempt to call out sort of the systemic um, efforts around equity, the social determinants of health or more uh, neighborhood at potentially level. Um, I think there's a level around sort of social needs and addressing individual patient needs, particularly in the context of healthcare that could be called out more explicitly um, in both of these definitions. I think we're increasingly seeing clinics identify and refer to community partners and they're identifying that as a social need rather than a social determinant. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anything? I wish to just no, capture that. You. Okay. Uh, Aaron Jolly from Washington County, you're up. Um, I first just wanted to um, agree that I think community-based entity is, sounds um, kind of exclusive to community-based organizations. So I think um, just broadening that to ensure that um, it includes government or city and county. Um, and then I think saying um, entity sounds like one organization to me, and I feel like it could um, be confusing if there's a cl a collaboratives or partnerships or county chips that um, CCOs are working with to invest in social determinant health and equity work, so something that makes it more inclusive to collaborative partnerships or work. Thank Great. You. Thank you for that. All right, we are going to move along to the next piece, Amanda. I'd like to add the nine tribes into that also. This is Sandy. Um, it's not specific. There's some language further on down the road, but not actually in this definition. So, Sandy, can we just get a little clarification there? Is that the request slash comment? Well, we, so when the, when the 1115 waiver was initiated, this was discussed with the nine tribes in NARA um, to make sure, I mean, it was for CMS to approve this, this was also part for the Medicaid part of it to have a, um, to have collaboration with the nine tribes to be part of some of a lot of our members are CCO members, so I just want that uh, documented. Great. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so the next definition, subparagraph E, social determinants of health and equity spending, clarifies the types of activities and strategies that may be included in social determinants of health and equity spending by the CCOs, including interventions at the population or community level and also interventions at the individual level. So this may include but is not limited to spending on health-related services, and there is a definition in your handout of the glossary um, on, on health-related services. Social determinants of health and equity spending means spending on services and initiatives designed to address social determinants of health and equity. Social determinants of health and equity may consist of spending on health-related services, as that term is defined in OAR, 
Social determinants of health and equity programs may involve interventions that occur outside a clinical setting and may pursue mechanisms of change, including population health policy change, meaning changes to rules or procedures within a community or an organization. Systems change, meaning changes to infrastructure within a community or organization and services to address individuals' health-related social needs, meaning an individual's social and economic barriers to health, such as housing instability or food insecurity. And just to note that additional guidance is being produced, and we'll have that available um, by October 1st for the CCOs to further clarify the types of interventions that would fall under social determinants of health and equity spending requirements. Amanda, let me ask, I know this is kind of the lead into a larger conversation about the spending piece. Do you want to open for feedback now or do you wish to keep going and then we'll get the totality of that? Let's open for feedback now because then we're going to move to community advisory councils okay. and come back. Great. Uh, seeing two hands in the room. Can I get just a show of hands in the room that are going to want to speak? I'm seeing one, two, three, four. Can I get a sense just by name only on the phone who will wish to speak to this particular point. Beth. Beth, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we're going to go around the room from the right. So, sir. Michael Anderson, maybe from HealthShare Oregon. Thank you. Um, I guess I, uh, I often think of addressing individual social needs as different from addressing social terms of health, and I feel like this definition puts the two of them together. And I, so, like, I can understand adding HRS for the community benefit side potentially as counting towards social terms of health and equity spending, but I'm not sure we want flex services or uh, individual social needs to be a part of that. And do, you, do you all, is there an intent about one of these two? The intent um, of the spending requirements that this um, relates to is to allow for some of those individual um, health-related social needs to be addressed under this type of work that the CCOs might be doing. Say, for example, when um, a CCO might address um, a particular housing need for an individual member or provide um, a fruit and veggie prescription for an individual member. So that is the intent, um, is to allow the flexibility for the, that sort of spending. So then in, in the definition the state's going to use, it's really social needs is a part of, is also a part of social needs and health spending. If you're adding, putting them together, you're not set to make a distinction. The intent is to um, make a distinction um, between um, the two levels of intervention, um, but to allow for both. Um, all right, uh, we're going to go this way, but we've got you in the queue from Northwest Health. Yes, sir. Yes, this is Glenn Pearson again, advocate. And I don't mean to be, keep beating on this, but transportation should be mentioned specifically, I believe. Transportation, so frequently we see services being provided, but they're provided where the rent is cheap, but there's no transportation to that service. The buses don't go in that direction, and so there's no way to get from where the service to the services frequently working with the health centers we discovered one of the biggest uh, reasons for not showing up is the lack of transportation so i think transportation is, is a really key piece that ties these many of these things together thank I'm, you I, I keep beating on that sure. but it's a, issue that we constantly hear. Sure. No, we appreciate your input. Thank you very much, sir. Um, continue. We'll come to you, ma'am. Okay. Um, I think Jesse. Somebody. No. All right. Uh, two. All right. Uh, Folks in the, on the phone, be patient with us. We will get to you. Tom Sensick, the Healthcare for All Oregon, nurse practitioner for many years working in school clinics. Thank you for mentioning fruit and veggie prescriptions. In particular, I was thinking about how broad does this go in terms of policy, spending, things like uh, limiting who can purchase soda, which is a poisoning our children right now. And uh, we have this huge obesity epidemic. It's a very serious issue. We got huge expenses with, uh, you know, renal clinics showing up all over the place. It's, it's a big problem. So I'm just wondering how broad, you know, they can go with this kind of spending in terms of policies. Thank you. Um, so the, um, just to clarify in terms of the intent of, um, of this, the population health policy change and systems change are meant to encompass the types of um, broader activities um, that might be related more to changing policy um, at either an organization or at a community level um, or changing um, actual sy systems um, in terms of how, how um, the systems are operated. 
We're going to go to Beth Englander on the phone from the Oregon Law Center, and then we'll come back to the woman at the far end of the table from me and then work our way around. Beth, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm just I'm wondering if someone could explain the intent behind the, the um, definition under spending of changes to policies and procedures. Why would that be included under, under the spending definition? Thank you, Beth. Um, so the intent of this particular portion of the rule is to clarify the types of um, interventions and areas in which a CCO might spend social determinants of health and equity dollars, um, and meant to clarify that those um, can be spent at different levels of intervention in terms of policy change, systems change, or um, services to address an individual's health-related social needs. Um, there will be additional guidance um, for the CCOs, um, and, and the CCOs also operate under, um, under Medicaid rules and others that, um, that dictate what types of things they are able to spend Medicaid funds on. But the intent is to um, broadly clarify that this is not talking only about community level change, but also about individual um, level health related social needs. And Beth, does but that are you are you anticipating are you anticipating that that um, CCOs could spend their their um, their social determinants of health budget on lobbying for changes in policies or or. That, that just that, that strikes me as, as odd. So I can't speak specifically to what we would anticipate they might be spending on, and, I, and they will have um, future guidance um, that will clarify. And also, as I mentioned, they have um, the CCOs do operate under um, Medicaid rules that might prevent them from spending in certain ways. Um, but this is just to, meant to um, clarify that different levels of, um, of intervention are possible. So, all right. Um, thank you, Beth. I think uh, hopefully that did that for you. And again, please feel free to submit additional comments or follow up. Got uh, at least I have two folks in the room, in the middle of the room, and on this side that were in queue before you. So let's go this direction, and then we'll head back over here, and we'll do one more round on the phone if needed. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Amanda Norma. I'm in Columbia County Hub, uh, and I'm representative of. A relatively rural community outside of Portland. And my question is, um, will this include job training and career readiness um, efforts as well? Our issues, our barriers are mainly socioeconomic and um, the poverty needs to be broken really through training and also feeding our own economic vitality and filling positions. Um, will that be included in spending? Is if I can ask folks on the phone, and if, if apologies if it's not you, there may be some noises coming from this building, um, but to make sure that everyone is muted if you're not speaking. It's the speaker. It's the speaker. Okay. okay. All right. Do um, you want to go ahead, Amanda? Sorry, I'm sure, going to see sure. if we can triage. Um, so I, I, I don't want to spend too much time going into um, all of the details of the types of things that are covered, but the um, under this raw definition. But there is a full list um, on the Medicaid Advisory Committee website of the types of. Um, uh, areas of social determinants of health that might be addressed. I think also um, we can't speak to what will be addressed in communities because that will really be based on uh, the community health improvement plan alignment and the CCO's work specifically. But um, there, I will say that the definition broadly includes um, various areas of social determinants of health. Okay, I just didn't see anything around training or career. It seemed more health-centered in the definition. So I was wondering. Yeah, so I think, um, so I'll just say that the um, that employment is part of the economic stability <coughs> domain um, broadly, but that the specific types of social determinants of health um, haven't been laid out in rule. All right, we've got one over here, and then, then we'll go over this direction. Uh, Christine Hyen, again from the Oregon Department of Justice. Is this an appropriate time to ask about um, 410-141-3845 So that will actually be discussed in the second of the Social Determinants of Health RACs, which okay, I believe is two weeks from today in the afternoon. August 15th. All right. Go ahead. Lorraine O'Brien, I just wanted to make sure that the systems changes included information systems mm -hmm. where, where, where we're hoping to electronically uh, communicate and refer from uh, health care to CDOs and back. Mm -hmm. um, so those policy changes, the workflow changes, is that included under systems changes? 
Um, I, I won't uh, specify that that specifically is something that would be funded again, but, um, but that is the type of, um, in the intention behind this definition is to include those types of changes. We know that a lot of CCOs um, and other healthcare partners are working on those IT solutions, and it is the intention that that work would be included under this. All right. Um, can I just see by show of hands in the room, and then let me just take a quick temperature check on the phone. Are there others that will want to get in on this? Okay. I'm going to limit this to two additional comments in the room, and then we'll move on. Sir? Yeah. So I, I think the, the health policy and systems change definitions are coming from the health policy board's addition of saying this is one of the opportunities for spending. I think I, I'm unclear, given that health-related services is already funded through different channels, I guess I have a question about how is how are we prioritizing this level of spending given it's the only f flavor of money that can support policy change um, and systems change? And so I just, I don't know where that is or where to put it. Um, and second, I think um, thinking about the opportunity of are we talking about internal spending done by the CCO um, versus through a partner, and how are we weighing that when we think about the uh, systems change and, po and policy change work? Because if it's work that the CCO should be doing anyway on systems improvement, we, I wouldn't want that to count towards, uh, uh, towards what this, I believe, is the intent from the Health Policy Board. So real quick, I'm going to ask Amanda to help summarize that and respond. Um, I'm also going to ask going forward, just because we are having a little bit of audio problem in the room, I have disconnected one of the speakers. So for individuals in the room to actually use the microphone to make sure that everyone in the back of the room and the phone can hear them. Great. So um, I'm going to summarize and just let me know, Jesse, if, um, if I don't get this right. Um, I think the first part oh, of your comment was about um, really the question about financing and, um, and question about health-related services and whether this is um, distinct from health-related services and if that's the case, whether those individual level flexible services um, should be included here. And I do want to clarify there that um, the, in terms of this part of the rule and social determinants of health and equity spending broadly, um, that we are clarifying that health-related services is a, is a portion of that and, and not um, all of that. So the distinction, it isn't necessarily a different um, uh, set of spending, but, but might encompass some health-related services. Um, and then the, the second piece, um, I think, of your comment was um, asking whether or a concern about whether there, um, if the CCO needs to be doing some um, infrastructure improvements or systems improvements um, generally, um, or spending um, they might generally do on their own operations, that um, you would not want that to be included in this type of spending. Um, and also, I think, to add to that, um, you your concern about uh, making sure that the community partners um, are being resourced um, to do the work that they are um, they are set up to do. Um, so just very briefly, I'll, I'll just res respond that the, the intent of the rule generally is to emphasize um, the relationship that the CCO has with their community partners, and, um, and later in the rule, um, we'll look more deeply at what that looks like in terms of how um, community partners might be resourced to do this work. And then also broadly, the intention is that this work um, goes above and beyond the general operations of the CCO. And then last from the Oregon Nursing Association. Sure. Uh, so I guess my comment is relative to your earlier comment that included both social needs and social determinants. And I just wanted to posit that I appreciate both, but in addressing simply social needs, it's limiting and it's dependent upon the person showing up at the location to get the services and not addressing the overall intent, which I believe is to change the community health outcomes more broadly. So. I'd like it as a both and, but not to only do the social needs piece. Thank you for your comment. So, Amanda, we are at 1010. I'm going to. If there's a logical piece and the group is good to go another 20 minutes, I'm going to suggest that we do that. Mm -hmm. Any issues or concerns? All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to now pass it over. We're going to skip now in the rule to subparagraph six, which is on page three of the rule related to community advisory councils, and I'm going to pass it over to Krista Mars. 
So, hi. Um, uh, as Amanda alluded to in our opening uh, comments, uh, there's some connection back to the Oregon Health Policy Board pro uh, policy priorities. And so I'm going to read to you the three that are connected. You can't hear her. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Oh, I bet you can. Can you hear me now? Maybe. Can we ask if you just push that spider mic back over this direction to see if that, that helps? Can you hear me on the phone? Right. We're going to do the best we can. Apologies okay. for that. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so. Ben. Yes. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to read the three. And last, real quick, again, folks on the phone, appreciate you jumping in to help us kill that uh, technical issue. But if you can remain on mute until we solicit time for you to get back in the queue. Thank you. Go ahead, Chris. So the two components of the rule related to community advisory councils are connected to health policy board priorities. And I'm just going to give a quick overview of what those were um, from the report in late 20. So first, require CCOs to designate a role for community advisory councils and tribes and or tribal advisory committee, if applicable, in directing and tracking slash reviewing spending. Requiring CCOs health-related services policies to include a role for the community advisory councils and tribes and or tribal advisory committees, if applicable, in making decisions about how community benefit health-related services decisions are made. And then the third is requiring CCOs to report on the Community Advisory Council member composition and alignment with the demographics of Medicaid members in their communities. So now I'll read the language in the rule. Sub um, paragraph A, CCOs shall designate a role for the Community Advisory Council in directing, tracking, and reviewing spending on social determinants of health and equity, including the social determinants of health and equity spending programs and health-related services community benefit initiatives as defined in OAR 410-141-3845. And you have a, just in your um, reference documents, you have a definition of a community benefit initiative, which is, which is what that's alluding to. Um, interested community advisory council members, for example, a member whose employer is up for consideration as an SDOH-E partner shall recuse themselves from the decision-making process. In subparagraph B, CCO shall submit reports to the authority no less than annually that describes the community advisory council's role in making decisions on these issues, as well as the CCO's efforts to align the CAC's composition with the CCO membership's demographic composition and community health improvement plan priorities. These reports will be posted publicly with appropriate redactions. Yep. So, okay. Yep. So, Ralph, do you want me to take? Yes. Okay. So. Stick Crosby again, all care CCO. Um, my concern is that only the CAC members are to recuse themselves as um, the innovator agent and then the, also the CCO staff are present at these and should maybe they recuse themselves, especially if it's something regarding policy change with these discussions. Thank you for your comment. And others in the room, yes sir. Uh, Michael from Health Share of Oregon. Uh, we uh, were hoping that uh, if we're trying to address health disparities that maybe our CAD composition should really include over-representation of some of our members that are most marginalized and face the severest health disparities instead of being just in alignment with our overall membership composition. So I would hope that you would include uh, requirements to really over-represent those most burdened by disease and disparities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Tom Simpson, Healthcare for All Oregon. I get to see the CCOs shall designate the role. And is there going to be guidelines or kind of, you know, I see the report that comes later, but it sounds to me like every CCO can decide what role their CHC will have based on how it's written here. And I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. Okay, thank you for your feedback. And, uh, sir, there'll be opportunity during the public comment period if you wish I'm to. I'm on Okay, and your name? Sean Hartman with SCIE 503. Okay, Sean, let me just hold two secs and take a temperature check on the phone to see if there are others that want to get in the queue on this, and we'll come back to you. Anyone on the phone? Sandy Sampson, Yellow Hawk Tribal Health Center. Okay, Sandy, anybody else? Thank you. All right, after the gentleman from SEIU, we'll come back to you, Sandy. Go ahead, sir. Um, yes, yeah, so Sean Parkman from SEIU. Uh, I just, a word of caution about the 
recusing everyone. Um, a lot of these uh, communities, a lot of these vulnerable communities have difficulty showing up to places, um, you know, if they're not, if there's not some financial support for that. And so there's kind of a question of like, if, if you receive financial support in order to be able to participate, then you refuse yourself to participate, then you end up in a situation like, well, who's there? You know, who can actually vote on anything? So that, that's just kind of a question. There's, there's always this desire to have kind of the, the nebulous, the public there, uh, or a community member, but it's just tough sometimes, because uh, a lot of these community organizations need support in order to be able to participate, but then they're all recusing themselves on certain issues. So it's just kind of a, a dilemma to consider, um, just caution about recusing so. across the board people can't. So we thank you for that. We welcome you to make room. Others are happy to make room at the table if you yeah. wish to join us up here. Um, I think you might be able to squeeze in right here. Um, I think let's go to Sandy from Yellowhawk, and then I saw one other hand go up on this side. Okay, Sandy, you've got the floor. Uh, thank you. So <clears throat> in the CCO 2.0 initial baseline expectations, it says CCO clearly articulates the criteria for select, selecting the um, SDOHHE partner. It intends to direct SDOHHE funding through a contract, a MOU, grant, or any other formal agreement. <clears throat> so um, I know that earlier it was defined that, um, that there would be a tribal advisory group or a participant within the CCO structure, which um, I don't think we've had. So I'm just curious in regards to the selection and criteria that, that the CCOs would provide for selecting the individual and how the money is um, spent through a contract. It, it sounds like that question is more related to the kind of spending decisions than this. Okay. You want to defer on it? I, How I, I think so. Okay. But I mean, I, I want to make sure if sure. Sandy has a, if I'm missing something. So Sandy, I think Chris just wants to do a listen check and make sure she got that. Do you want to feedback back what you think you Well, I'm, I mean, it's all based off the CHP, which is what the assessment that has done by the CCO, but it hasn't been shared with the individual organizations throughout the state. So, and, and that's your requirement in the CCO 2.0, you're asking for that to happen. There is more transparency and clarity in regards to how their community assessments were um, actually done. The community health improvement plans need to be will be shared publicly. Will be reported to or submitted to the OHA and uh, posted publicly. Correct. So I believe that provision is in one of the upcoming rule uh, advisory committees later in the month. But yes, that is something that is in the proposed rule. So that hopefully she'll address that should address that issue. I think we had one other person in the room here. Michael again from Health Show. I just wanted to get back on my comment about. Um, members, council members needing to accuse themselves from the decision making and that, that could really be a disincentive for folks joining councils and it can already be challenging enough and so it can. I just want to underscore that. It really can be a barrier for CCOs okay. to get CEC membership. All right. Thank you. So I'm seeing a number of hands go up. Let me just acknowledge we will, uh, and Mary apologies, Marianne Blankenship, then we will go Robin to Traver. Robin from Pacific. Uh, UHA. UHA. Thank you. Then Jeremiah, did you want to get in? He'll probably cover. Okay. And Northwest Health Foundation, did you wish to speak? I just had a clarification about the recusal <coughs> provision. Okay. Because I'm getting confused about individuals versus employees. Okay. Let's start over here. Okay. Um, well, so picking up with the rec recusal piece, and I think we have a little bit of concern around that, just uh, whether it's appropriate to have the recusal <coughs> language in the section at all, because the CAC at the end of the day is not the, the final fiduciary decision maker. Um, so I think that's just something that needs some further consideration. And then I'll just take this moment to say, you know, I think that as we were reading through the rule, um, we, there's, we have a little bit of concern around the potential for somewhat blurring the boundaries between the role of the CAC and the, member, the membership that sits on the CAC, 
at CAC and, uh, and the role of the governance board. And in the case of Pacific Source, that's our health council um, governance board. Um, and when I look at the uh, requirements around tracking and reviewing and, and doing oversight, um, I, I think that the CACs, um, at least the CACs that we are um, engaged with, uh, often don't necessarily, we're not, they are being recruited for sort of managerial oversight and management skills, financial oversight. So I just, I think that um, I, you know, absolutely appreciate the, the underlying intent of trying to make sure that the engagement of the CAC is robust, that their expertise in the community setting is really brought to the table. But we do have some concerns around um, just sort of the potential blurring of the CAC's role and the governance board's role. Thank you for that. Uh, next in the room. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, is this language indicating that the CACs have a decision-making authority or is it you know, an advisory capacity to make recommendations to the governing board? And if it's the latter, then um, maybe adjust the language there and, uh, instead of making decisions, possibly add advising. All right. Thank you for that feedback. I think we had a couple more in the room, then we'll check in on the phone. Anybody else in the room? Jeremiah, you're good? All right. On the phone, anyone else after Sandy wish to engage on this? All right. Uh, moving on. And we're going to shoot to take a break at 1030, if that helps. And we'll just get through the next um, section, if that, okay. if that works. Um, and we'll pass it over to Maria um, for the health equity plan. Um, I don't think I'm going to have enough time. Should we, should we okay. Now? Why don't we do that? Let's take a 10-minute break. Um, people on the phone, listen, this is very important. This is the first time we have used this technology platform in this room. It is our sincere intention right now to remove everyone in the general public off of mute. And I will ask if you wish to sign up for public comment. If for any reason we lose you, please, please, please call back in. Give us a minute or two to reset, and we will be back online. We hope this doesn't happen, but we're not trying to get rid of you. So we're going to try to take everyone off mute right now. All right, everyone, the general public has been removed off mute. Is there anyone out there that would like to submit? I'm going to ask folks in the room just to keep it. Hold on one sec. Folks in the room, I'm going to ask you to keep it quiet just to a moment so we can solicit who wants to sign up for public comment on the phone. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can we please have some uh, This is Carolyn Anderson, but I might and I might not. Okay, Miss Anderson, I got you. Anybody else? All right. I will ask one more. Wait. Go ahead. Okay, I might or might not, but I'm a little nervous. This is new, and I, I'm, I'm having a hard time. No problem, ma'am. You're doing great. I will check in when we resume, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we will be on mute. And everyone on the phone, we hope you are still with us. Have you taken... Have you put <laughs> are the general public have been placed back on mute? All right, let's do that. Your line is now muted. So. I think that's correct. All right. Can I get a check-in from either Beth Englander or Sandy from Yellowhawk, who should still be on with us as participants? <laughs> I'm thinking you just muted us. <laughs> Is everybody on the phone? Beth, can you let us know by a voice check? Or Sandy from Yellowhawk. Or Cheryl Anderson. I'm hearing from someone on the phone that we can't they can't hear us. Okay. 
Your line is now unmuted. All right. Uh, can we get a listen check from Baby Sandy from Yellowhawk or Beth Englander from OLC to confirm you all can hear us? Yep, we can hear you. Great, thank you. All right, we are going to resume and hand off back to the social determinants team. So we're going to go to the health equity plan or health equity infrastructure. Um, before, a little introduction to the health equity plans on the CCO maturity assessment, um, it became really clear that um, there, there wasn't the progress that we had uh, hoped around health equity. There was progress in some areas and some um, not so much. And, um, and we want to make sure that the CCOs were prepared to um, address health equity by building the infrastructure that requires um, to dedicate time and effort for, to the elimination of health disparities. So the, this was CCO policy option five on the uh, policies that went to OHPB, the Oregon Health Policy Board for approval. They received extensive uh, public comments. Uh, and it says um, basically the same. I'm going to read it anyway. The CCO policy option said that we will require CCOs to adopt um, a health equity plan, including culturally and linguistically responsive practice to institutionalize organizational commitment to health equity, require a single point of accountability with budgetary decision making, authority and health equity expertise, and require um, an organization-wide cultural responsiveness and implicit bias fundamental training plan and timeline for implementation. Those were the three items that received extensive um, uh, comments. And just for the purpose of uh, all sharing the same mental model, when we refer to health equity infrastructure, uh, we refer to the adoption of culturally and linguistically responsive models and policies and practices, including but not limited to community and member engagement, provision of quality language access, workforce diversity, ADA compliance and accessibility uh, of CCO and provider network, ACA 1557 compliance, uh, CCO and provider network organizational training and development, implementation of the class standards, non-discrimination policies, and I could go on and on. And on. So in the rule, it reads, um, I'm going to read the, the full rule and then I'll open up for um, comments. The rule says, um, CCOs shall develop and implement a health equity plan to address health disparities that exist among the CCO members and more generally the communities within the CCO service areas. The health equity plan shall include the following. A narrative of the health equity plan development process, including description of meaningful community engagement. <coughs> B, health equity focus areas, including strategies, goals, objectives, activities, and metrics. And C, a plan for ensuring that the CCO staff and provider network are trained on cultural responsiveness, implicit bias, and anti-discrimination laws in accordance to the authority standards. The health equity plan shall be submitted to the authority for review and approval, and the CCO shall designate a, CIS, a single point of accountability for health equity with budgetary decision making, authority, and health equity expertise. All right, let's open up for comments and feedback. I'm seeing one hand in the room, two hands in the room. Can I see them raised a little higher? All right. One, two, three, four. This time we're going to go five. Hot topic. We're going to go left to right this time, and then we will solicit on the phone. So, I think North. Uh, I, I would just recommend that a definition of health equity be placed in the rule. Um, there isn't a definition in the rule, and there should be. Thank you. Stick across we all care CCO. I do not see an involvement of a regional health equity coalition if they're in the area within here, and I would just like to see something with that so that way you have uh, some local control and accountability within the rule. So whether the, it's put in with the authorities review or if it's a pull of it. Thank you for that. Just, for the, just to make sure that you, um, in case there is a question about that, the health equity plan will have an extensive guidance document 
that will probably answer some of the questions that you may have that are not addressed in rule because they're processes. And we'll just continue on this line around. I think a number of folks. Go ahead. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm Christy Hyen with the Department of Justice. And then in Section C, where it says a plan for ensuring the staff and for better network are trained on various things. Um, I don't know if it's part of your vernacular, but anti oppression training, is that something that would be of use to you? Uh, or, or to say out loud, in addition to cultural responsiveness and implicit bias? And Thank you. We do have in the guidance and document, we do have a, a description of the items uh, that we suggest are included in the, in the uh, training plan. Um, we can definitely add something like that. Okay. Specifically, um, Depart or Department of Justice uses anti-oppression in some of its um, funding announcements and as a priority or a value. Thank you. Um, I think there's one on this side of the chart. I think you're going to hold on. Go ahead. Uh, from You got it. Yep. Yes. Marion. Marion, thank you. Source. Hi. Um, actually, just a pretty specific question with regard to the training requirements. Um, in the event there isn't an OHA-approved vendor for a particular training and or we decide that we're going to develop some training materials in-house, will OHA want to, to review and approve content? Um, there is a process where uh, we, the Cultural Competency Com Continuing Education Committee, mm -hmm. develop competencies and standards of what a good cultural competency plan should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, we are asking you to develop a plan along those guidelines. Uh, we uh, don't have a plan to review the trainings in particular, um, but we expect you to add those trainings and the process for the development using the, guy, uh, the, the health equity plan. Thank you. All right. Now the gentleman from Yam Hill CCO. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shani, Yam Hill CCO. Um, so cultural competency training for providers in the network um, is is pretty much a requirement in licensing boards, um, and to have the CCOs uh, ensure that that is done seems like it's probably duplicating some of the requirements. So I'm wondering whether it should be that perhaps training could be offered to the provider network rather than ensuring the provider network is being trained because that ensuring uh, is happening through the licensing board. Thank you. When we were developing the health equity plan and, and the rules, um, that was still a bill that was in the legislation. Um, so uh, that's why it's not included in here and we haven't made the reference to it. Okay. Um, real quick, anyone else before we get over to Healthcare for All Oregonians? And then the gentleman from SEIU, anyone in between? All right. And I assure you that by August 20th, I will know all of you by name. All right. Yes, sir. Tom Sinsick, Healthcare for All Oregon. This is a really good item. And I think going forward, uh, maybe this could come under the grievance or some other place down the line, but the idea of how to make sure that the people have access to the provider of choice which is actually called for in the future, it's SB 770. Um, that is because some providers just are not going to be culturally comp competent and without bias and, and making sure the system, maybe it's a different topic, not for us. But I just want to mention that here, that, uh, that this, there's a way to make sure that people have access to those kind of service providers. Thank you. Thank you. Before the gentleman from SEIU, I just want to do a check on the phone to see who wants to get in the queue on this. We'll come back to finish the room and then come back to the phone. So who on the phone would like to engage on this? All right. Gentlemen. Um, Aaron, Aaron Jolly from Washington County. Okay, Aaron, we will come straight to you after this next pass in this side of the room here. Uh, Sean Parkman, SEIU 503. Uh, I have question uh, clarification um, around CCO shall designate a single point of accountability part. Um, what do we mean by accountability, a single point of accountability? What's the intent of, of that rule? And I'm assuming a point of accountability within the CCO as opposed to the 
um, advisory council just seeking clarification on what's the intent there? The intent of the single point of accountability is to uh, have a point person in the CCO that will uh, be responsible and accountable for health equity activities and the development of the, of, the, of the health equity plan. The reason why is uh, we haven't had that opportunity before and some CCOs chose to dedicate a staff to uh, health equity, some others didn't. Uh, so we wanna make sure everybody has a single point of accountability that will be the person that OHA can reach out to uh, for all issues around health equity. And what was your, the second part of your question again? Um, that, that really was the intent of my question. Um, like accountability means to me that there are consequences um, as opposed to like someone is there to pick up the phone. So I, I don't know that the rule really spells that out or if accountability is the word that's really meant here, but that's what it means to me. Thank you. Uh, continuing around on this side of the room, and then if I can ask someone on the phone, we're getting some ambient noise from you to stay on mute. After we finish in the room, we'll have Aaron Jolly from Washington County. Sure. Someone before you, ma'am, I'm sorry. Anybody else in between you and the gentleman? Nope, okay, you got it. Uh, Deborah Riddick, ONA, and so I'm glad you lifted that up because that was a point I wanted to make as well, and we support the accountability piece. But also in uh, under A, where the CCOs develop and implement, uh, I don't see where it's a partnership between the development piece with the, uh, the CACs, with the CDCs. Um, the way it reads is that it's in isolation, so I just want to make sure that's explicit, that they're not developing that. And the same can be said of the meaningful um, community engagement. If the community's not saying what's meaningful to them, then we lose all of that. So to make sure that they are explicitly involved in that definition and creating that definition. Thank you. And go ahead. Marina O'Brien, um, the, the number C there, the cultural responsiveness, I just wanted to make sure that trauma-informed care was included in there because with social determinants of health, we have a huge opportunity to, re to, reduce, the, you know, to reduce that trauma by not asking trauma patients to repeat the same stories if we electronically in the guidance document, we have a list of suggested fundamental trainings, and um, the training you just mentioned is one of the ones that we suggest. All right, and I think the gentleman from HealthShare. This is Michael from HealthShare. Um, so currently, there are several requirements within things like the TQS that address some of this. Is the intent to pull the reporting and all that out of that and put it all in one spot, or will there be this health equity plan and then also get stuff in the TQS? I'm just trying to reduce duplication and confusion and different timelines. <laughs> so yes, um, the TQS and the health equity plan are two different things. Uh, the health equity plan, it's almost like a strategic plan that addresses health equity. TQS is meant to be a transformational and quality strategy plan. Um, they, uh, they have to be submitted at the same time, although they are different. And the reason why we continue having health equity uh, items in the, um, in the TQS is because we are not sure exactly what we're going to get um, uh, with the health equity plan as we want to make sure that we give the opportunity for um, CCOs to um, uh, you do trial and error and you can only do that in, with uh, tools such as uh, the TQS. Right, and still continuing in the room then we'll go to Washington County. Yeah, uh, Lakeisha Dumas, uh, Chair of the Traditional Health Worker Commission. Uh, I was just looking at C and uh, when we talk about cultural responsiveness and but I heard you say cultural competency, which competency cannot be achieved by anyone. Um, I was just wondering about the language we're using. Thank you. The reason why is, uh, I mentioned cultural competency, it's because the cultural competency continuing education committee develop a definition of cultural competency. Uh, we, this, we choose to call it cultural responsiveness 
but uh, the, the, the committee had to develop a list of competencies, and, and that's the reason why they adopted the cultural competency definition. It's not culturally competent, but cultural right. competency. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to go to uh, Aaron from Washington County on the phone, then we will circle back to Stick and over here. Robin, I will learn Robin's name by the end, by, by noon. Um, and then we will close this piece and move on to the next pieces. So Erin Jolly from Washington County. Um, I'm wondering about if there can be a specified role of the CAC in the health equity plan, especially um, related to the community engagement processes um, connected to the plan. Um, and then I also think there needs to be some connection or alignment between the health equity plan and the CHIP. Um, specified my comment. Thank you for that. All right, um, we're going to return to the room. Stick Crosby. I would just like to piggyback on Michael's statement um, with the double reporting. Some of the things I could imagine in the health equity plan could be transformational. So I could see maybe reporting on them twice, but maybe a little bit of flexibility in the, the projects or the city or something within that. So that's just my only comment after hearing that. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And Robin. Yeah, back to the single point of accountability for health equity um, with budgetary decision-making authority. I have two questions. Is that meant to be a dedicated position, A, and then B, is that the budget-making or the budgetary decision-making authority, is that referring to that position needs to be an executive level? Um, the single point of accountability is not meant to be a dedicated position. And yes, we want to elevate health equity to the director level. All right, I think we're going to close out discussion on this piece and move on to the next. Thank you. So now we're actually going to jump back up in the rule. Um, we're going to start back up at subparagraph 2F and the definitions related to the social determinants of health and equity spending program. And just to provide a little bit of context before reading through um, this portion of the rule, um, these next sections implement uh, policy number one of the Oregon Health Policy Board's policies. Um, and there are two pieces that I want to call out related to policy number one. The first piece is implementing House Bill 4018, which was passed in 2018, to require CCOs to spend a portion of net income or reserves on social determinants of health and health disparities, including alignment with community health improvement plans and requiring contracts or, um, and this piece will require contracts or agreements um, with SDOH and E partners and direct a portion of spending to social determinants of health and equity partners. Um, this is that second piece is related to the Oregon Health Policy Board's uh, policy number one recommendations. Um, we earlier had discussed an additional requirement um, related to the role of the CAC, which is also part of policy number one, um, the role of the CAC in these spending decisions. The second piece of the Oregon Health Policy Board's uh, policy recommendations is that concurrent with this implementation of House Bill 4018, we would seek to build in a specific amount of social determinants of health and equity investment in the first two years of the new contracts. Um, so I'll just um, clarify the connection um, in a moment, but the, the purpose of this definition is really to clarify then what is meant by a social determinants of health and equity spending program, which is something we've defined to encompass these two specific e efforts, two specific programs, um, which are currently outlined in the draft contract. And um, these two specific programs are the Supporting Health for All Through Reinvestment Initiative, the SHARE Initiative, which is the, we'll talk about in much more detail later in this rule, um, but is related to the House Bill 4018 initiative, or House Bill 4018, and then boosting up investment in long-term development for the Social Determinants of Health and Equity Fund, otherwise called the BUILD Fund. And then we'll also, I'll also read through the portions of the rule that lay out the general requirements for any of these social determinants of health and equity spending programs that are described within this rule or otherwise established in the future. So I'm going to now read through the rule. Um, I will stop with, in a few points just to give a little bit more clarification, but I want to read through this whole piece so that you have a chance to comment on all of it. 
Um, the Social Determinants of Health and Equity Spending Program means a program overseen by the authority with specific requirements for a CCO Social Determinants of Health and Equity Spending as set forth in the contract. Social Determinants of Health and Equity Spending Programs include, but may not be limited to, supporting health for all through reinvestment initiative or the SHARE initiative, boosting up investment in long-term development for Social Determinants of Health and Equity Fund or the BUILD Fund. And the following general requirements apply to any Social Determinants of Health and Equity Spending Program. That the CCOs shall select Social Determinants of Health and Equity Spending Priorities based on the CCO's most recent Community Health Improvement Plan that is a shared plan with the collaborative partners as defined in um, this rule. The rule that's referenced here is related to community health assessments and community health improvement plans, and that's the rule, one of the rules that will be considered on August 15th, changes to that rule, including local public health authorities and local hospitals. If the CCO has not yet developed a shared ship, the CCO shall align its priorities with those identified in community health improvement plans, TIPS, developed by other stakeholders in the service area, such as local public health authorities, hospitals, and other CCOs. And the intent of this provision is really to align spending with community priorities for greater impact. The second um, requirement is that any um, the CCO shall select spending priorities based on any social determinants of health and equity priority areas identified by the authority. Um, and just a note that the current priority is housing-related services and supports, which is defined in the separate set of definitions that you have as a document. A portion um, of social determinants of health and equity spending program expenditures must go directly to social determinants of health and equity partners for the delivery of services or programs, policy or systems change, or any of these to address the social determinants of health and equity as agreed by the CCO. CCO shall enter into a contract with each social determinants of health and equity partner that defines the services to be provided and the CCO's data collection methods as provided in the contract between the authority and the CCO. These contracts shall be submitted to the authority for, and this, just a note here, that this is an error, actually, we'll be taking out this sentence. It was included in error. And then the CCO shall report completed and anticipated social determinants of health and equity expenditures using the format specified by the authority. These reports will be posted publicly. So we'll just open it up here for feedback, um, and then we have a specific um, question, actually, for REC members around subparagraph B, which relates to a portion of social determinants of health and equity spending program expenditures that must go directly to social determinants of health and equity partners. We have not defined, you'll see here, of course, that we haven't defined a specific portion, um, an amount in rule, um, and we'd be interested in feedback on whether to define this specifically, and if, if so, if the feedback is, if so, if um, any of you have comments or feedback about um, what an appropriate amount might look like. So generally, would love your feedback on all of this section, um, and specifically if you have any feedback related to that question. So if we can get by show of hands in the room who will want to speak, okay. And if we can pause and just check in on the phone and see who will have questions or feedback specific to Amanda's question. Beth. Beth, anybody else? Thank you. Andy Johnson. I'm sorry, Johnson, first name? No, Sandy Sampson. Sandy Yellow Sampson. Hawk. Thank you, Sandy from Yellowhawk. All right. Anybody else? What I would like to do in the spirit of fairness is actually to open up with our friends who are on the phone with us. So why don't we start with Beth and Sandy, then we'll move to the room. So Beth, go for it. Okay, um, thanks. I have a, a couple of, of comments and questions. One is um, in, in sub F, um, when you're saying uh, spending as set forth in the oh, SDOHE spending programs include but may not be limited to, I think I think you didn't mean to use the word may there. I think you're intending it to be um, shall shall not be limited to, but just to clarify that um, so it doesn't end up getting fought over at the at some point. I think it should if you mean it to be that they they can't be limited to, then it needs to be more. Um, it needs to be a shall, not be. Um, and then, um, let's see. I guess I'm, I am 
a little, I'm, I'm just a little concerned about how, um, how the amount, how the amount that gets spent on social determinants of health, how it, how it's going to be decided what the appropriate, um, you know, spending projects are. It, I mean, it looks like there'll be a, a plan, um, but. It, I'm just I'm a little bit concerned about that. There doesn't seem to be any direction onto into in terms of what data needs to be collected in order to determine what health disparities specifically exist. So I'm just um, I'm concerned about that. Um, and I think that's about it. I think I'd I'd like to hear what other people say about what portion of spending should go directly to the to partners. Um, so I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Uh, we'll go to Sandy on the phone, and then we'll go around the room. So um, it says CCO has made choose to elect one or two community priorities for spending in addition to statewide housing priorities. Is that inclusive? And, and in your uh, opening statement, there was tribes were not included in your community partners. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so I should clarify that, um, yes, tribes are um, definitely included and are laid out as part of the collaborative partners um, language in the community health assessment and community health improvement plan rule um, that will be looked at on August 15th. Um, and the language is specifically laid out there to um, account for the fact that tribes are um, to be invited to participate, but are, are, of course, not required to participate. But we appreciate that feedback generally. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, I think I lost your first part of the question. Can you repeat your first part? So it says to, um, the CCO may choose to select one or two community priorities for spending in addition to statewide housing priorities. <clears throat> and my understanding when we met with um, the OHA director that that there would be a tribal advisory committee that they're working on to actually approach this. And the state still needs to do tribal consultation into the changes. So uh, I'm just curious when that will be taking place. Sure, Kevin. So, so OHA did deliver a, a Dear Tribal Leader letter. I. Uh, last well today is August 1st I can safely say last month that was delivered by Julie Johnson I can say that with confidence so I, I can't speak to beyond that um, I know that the scheduling is kind of an iterative process to see what works in an otherwise very busy schedule with tribal consultations um, so I, I know that message was delivered and then there was a so second among can I ask you a question amongst the, the RAC committee? Who is actually going to do the presentation? OHA, the people that are delivering the, the, the comments and the suggestions regarding rules and regulation changes? Uh, Will they be available to the tribal organization? Uh, yes. My message to Julie and her team here was please let us know which subject matter experts need to be available upon request. So we are going to do everything we can to honor that. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. All right, let's mix it up and start on this side of the room. Uh, I don't know if I can comment on this part right now, but um, the definition of housing related so services and supports, oh, Lakeisha, um, chair of the Traditional Health Workers Commission. But it reads, um, services and supports may include services at the individual level, e.g. individual assistance with a housing application process, or at the community level, e.g. community health workers station in affordable housing communities. I just want to be careful that we say traditional health workers, because depending on if they have mental health and addiction uh, challenges, it might be a peer or if they're pregnant, it could be a doula, but um, some people use community health workers and traditional health workers interchangeably, so really making that distinction. Thank, Thank you. you. And going Jeremiah. Anybody in between you and Jeremiah? I'm sorry. Nope. All right. Yeah, so Jeremiah, sorry, uh, two, two things. The first, um, a little uh, heartburn over the fact that CCO shall enter into contracts with each partner um, and being clear about what those contracts are. Not that we don't agree that contracts are great. Our experience has been that contracts aren't really appropriate for every type of partnership we want to get into, especially if the community-based organization is less established. Um, and we are hoping 
and doing things in an aspirational way uh, for certain outcomes, but probably not a great thing to put in contract every now and then. So if possible, it, it'd be great to have some flexibility. I think we, we do want the outcomes that are listed in B. You know, we would like to track data, um, but I'm not sure if a contract is always the most appropriate thing as far as flexibility goes. And to the general question about our proportion of spending, I think that may be a little premature only because statewide activities are so, the housing crisis is such a big issue that what putting money towards that means it is, is really community specific. I can tell you what that means in the metro area versus what that has meant in Columbia Pacific would be really hard to say a proportion of your spending should go to that from this place um, because it just wouldn't fit in the same way in those two service areas, if that makes sense. So it, it might make sense to hold CCOs accountable for what they are spending on within a statewide activity after you see what they've spent money on and why, as opposed to saying what that proportion should be right now. Thank you, and I just, uh, thank you for your comments, and I wanna just clarify, um, because we use portion in a couple of places in this rule, and I wanna make sure um, people are clear on the different, um, different pieces that we're talking about. And in this section of the rule, we're specifically talking about a portion of um, the spending program expenditures overall um, that rather than um, maybe being spent on programs that um, might be operated by the CCO or on services operated so that would be um, put directly towards community partners um, through those sorts of contracts or agreements. But we will also talk about a portion later on um, that um, that is related more to the um, 4018, the new requirements for CCOs to spend a portion of their um, net income or reserves on social determinants of health and health disparities. And so I just wanted to take this moment to distinguish between the two that we're talking about. And here we're really talking about of the requirement um, for spending, whatever that looks like, um, the amount. Is there any feedback on what portion um, might be designated towards community partners? So just to um, make sure everyone's on the same page about those pieces. Jeremiah, did you want to follow up before you yeah, pass I, the I, baton? Yeah, to be clear, I, I appreciate that. And I, we got a lot of great community-based organizations, but in the event you're in a rural area and you've given a lot of money to one organization or, or perhaps there isn't somebody or an entity that you trust enough to put money into, you won't be forced to put money into into them if they're not ready or not capable of doing what you want to put in the contract. And so, just a, Thank, you for Thank you for that feedback. Thank you for that. Staying on this side of the room. Okay. Go ahead. Nope, I saw a bunch of hands going up. All right, um, well, I guess no one but SEIU. Um, yes, yeah, so just a point of clarification. So about this, this question of um, subsection B uh, proportion of funds and community um, organizations, if there were a situation where there were a broad um, uh, policy initiative that's trying to change a big structural lever, social determinant of health lever, such as a, I don't know, a broad um, housing policy or something to that effect, would a CCO be limited to investing in that effort if it were a statewide effort? Would they be limited to um, a relationship with a, a, a community-based organization in their catchment area, or could they participate in a broader statewide initiative, given this rule? Thank you for that question. I'm not sure I can provide um, actually a really good response right now. I think I might need to think about this a little bit more um, and make sure um, uh, to consider what the intent of the role is that we've put together and, and whether that um, some kind of statewide effort would comply. I think in terms of looking at um, the requirements of the spending, um, the, the connection to the community um, includes the connection to a community health improvement plan priorities. Um, and, um, and I think we might need to think a little bit more about whether um, a statewide effort um, would align with the community health improvement plan <coughs> or not. Um, so I can't give you a, um, an okay. answer, but we can take that back and I appreciate the feedback. Uh, okay, so can I follow up? Is that, yeah. Sure. Um, so the, um, what I would say to that is um, I know that this particular issue is, is difficult for, from the CCO's point of view and also the community's or, um, point of view. One issue is the one I just mentioned. Like, um, if there were a well-organized 
you know, policy initiative that could really change things, uh, social determinants of health orientated policy. Um, there, you know, one might want to think about that. The other thing that I would uh, just mention, and I, I don't have a specific number, but I, I am kind of pushing for, the, or I at least want to make the case for having a specific number for an investment. My reasoning is this. Um, the um, uh, vast majority of healthcare, of, of uh, money spent in the United States on health is spent on healthcare, um, 80%. And um, we know that about 15% or so of health outcomes are because of health care, right? The, the rest of it is due to social determinants of health and, and various other, um, you know, where you live. So that would seem to me to kind of like push us to want to have some kind of guidance that um, we really need to be pushing some resources out, at least in this, this fund that's actually for that, um, into those you know, broad social determinants, community-based level health interventions. Um, and that we, understanding Jeremiah's point that there may not be community organizations that are ready for that, but this kind of puts a little fire on their both. There's like, then we need to get them, you know, there needs to be some fire in order to get them ready. We can't, we can't allow them that. I get the idea, I get, it. you know, if you're forced to do it and then it's not ready, that's ugly. But um, I, I just kind of put in the case out there that we might need to actually have some rules to kind of like, you know, push the system for readiness um, to do that because we can't take a pass. And like, well, that's too hard. Um, so just put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. So let me do this. We will go backwards just once around the table, but I also want to begin to look and manage the clock and look to Amanda and how much real estate we have to cover in the next 45 minutes or so, including a brief public comment period. Um, so can I just get a show of hands in the room who is okay? Thank you very much. We'll go back to you and then over to Healthcare for All Oregon. So Emily Fanjoy again, um, and my question sort of line up with your comments. I, or my comments line up with your comments. I'm not sure if it's going to end in a question mark, but it seems really tricky based on the writing of this to understand how we have kind of top-down decision making that's going to result in systemic change for social determinants of health when we talk about the readiness of community-based organizations because readiness is determined by the same system that is sort of perpetuating health inequity. And if we're not aware of that and writing that into this plan, I don't think we're doing as much as we could in terms of creating more equity. And that goes to community, community-based organizations that aren't ready, like what kind of supports can we put in place to make them ready? Because there's so much focus in healthcare about um, evidence-based actions to address these social determinants of health. And a lot of our community-based organizations haven't had precedent to do research and develop evidence-based practices that we can demonstrate to healthcare as a whole. And so if we're going to talk about partnering, we have to address how we can get those organizations ready and support them in evaluating and looking at was this program effective and being willing to make some mistakes in terms of creating more equity. And I don't see that built into this in a way that makes me pretty confident and comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. And Tom from Healthcare. Tom Sensick, Healthcare for All Oregon. Uh, first of all, I want to clarify a language issue that's in here. Uh, it's page three, maybe I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. A portion of the amount set in dividends or payments are both to shareholders, and is that supposed to be parent companies versus parents? Thank you for that comment. And um, yes, we will be jumping to that section shortly, and I think we can clarify that piece um, when we walk through that. Because that's, I want to support this, like this stuff right here that's just been said. And I do want to speak exactly to the idea uh, of the next section about giving money to shareholders. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, straight ahead. Um, I just have a question. Amanda Normine with Columbia County Hub. Um, and it kind of goes off of here. Um, so I have economic development hat um, as well as mental health hat on. And I in my economic development world was not as aware of the initiatives that are being talked about at this table. And I'm wondering if there is a marketing component that may 
be added to this that would allow CCOs to bring this to the forefront of the community? Because my guess is that there are probably community organizations that could handle this, but have no idea that their mission is actually healthcare fundable, um, or that they can even be asking for money. Thank you. Yes. Carly Hoodwag, Oregon Primary Care Association. Um, I think what I'm hearing a lot of folks say, and I, I would very much agree with, is potentially looking at putting some clarity around um, the requirements for these buckets of money, whether it's House Bill 418, um, the global spending, or even health-related services that suggest more upstream systemic spending versus the individual social needs. I think we default um, in the healthcare system and say we're doing social determinants of health work by paying for a connection to the food bank or a transportation voucher. And that really isn't getting us at the change that our CCO model is meant to do uh, in our state and nationally, frankly. So I think clarifying that incentive or encouraging a certain proportion be spent on systems level versus social need is um, would be helpful guidance. Thank you for that. And next around the table. Anybody over in that corner? A little blind spot. Nope. All right. Um, quickly, um, in subsection little b, it says <laughs> these contracts shall be submitted to the Oregon Health Authority for a period. Yes, um, so that is an error. Okay. Um, it but what is supposed to be there? Um, it's not supposed to be included. Though. The whole sentence, sentence is just to be there. an okay. error. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, my office provides a lot of grants to community based organizations, and we see a lot of the same things that have been spoken here about their capacity or knowledge of or sophistication for managing contracts, especially those contracts that come with you know, evidence based and outcome requirements, um, and I think it uh, does put them at a disadvantage uh, to play this field without some support from the CCO to learn how to do it or to become uh, positioned well enough or infrastructure enough to do that. I mean, they run on very tight administrative budgets, I mean, sometimes bare bones uh, to the point where I can't understand how they're operating. And uh, it just concerns me a lot of this language around contracts, 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 and um, outcome, you know, evidence base, and all of these these terms, which I see the value in, but our community-based organizations, um, it just creates a big divide. And, and they are the ones who are meeting with people every day in you know in our communities. They're the ones doing the face-to-face -face work in many ways. Thank you. Thank you. To Crosby All Care, I would like to echo everything that was said, but yes, definitely technical assistance. That's what we spend a lot of time doing with these community based organizations. And then the original reason I raised my hand is I do not see again regional health equity coalitions involved with this. For that, again, local accountability to make sure we're addressing health equity in the region if they're present. Thank you. Thank you. And Northwest Health Foundation. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> I think we'd echo that policy change and systems change <clears throat> happening just within the CCO geographic boundary feels a little ridiculous. Uh, it would be maybe ironic that these resources couldn't support community organizations to sit at this very rulemaking table to address statewide policy change um, through the RAC process. It feels ironic that we would say that the CHIPS geography has to be the limiting factor. Um, I think I do support uh, defining a portion for external spending through social determinants of a health partner. Um, I think you could get at that at least through a competitive process. And then to Jeremiah's point, if there were not re responses back that sort of met the threshold, then the CCO could then move forward path and spend it internally. But I think the, the push to drive more of that resource out into the community makes sense. And, and frankly, we hear from CCOs that they actually need more specific guidance so they know they're doing the right thing. So I would support a portion of that. And I think to Carly's point about um, the uniqueness of and pushing towards systems change and policy change work, um, I think directing a portion of the overall spending towards that I think would also give some clarity and some and, um, some direction that indeed we want to see some spending on it. I think if CCOs will default to what they know and health related services and individual needs is pretty specific and even the community benefit initiative side is much more easy to grab 
to wrap your arms around. Um, so again, requiring that portion kind of helps push CCOs into a space. Uh, I would also say on the technical assistance front, the opportunity to aggregate, again, aggregate these policy and systems change funds gives CCOs the opportunity to think about technical assistance across <coughs> the states to small emerging organizations that all need technical assistance and not just relying on each individual CCO to be the, the, the nonprofit capacitator um, to build those skills. And I feel like that's an opportunity, again, that the pooling of funds. And then one last point, I think as we move towards value-based payments, we don't have the evidence out there that some of our community-based organizations providing services have have the ability to help CCOs meet metrics um, in order to provide value-based payments. So I just want to make sure that these resources, uh, besides aligning with CHIP, could also be used for some of this evidence work um, so that five years from now, if we're all the way in values-based payments, that CBOs don't get shut out of the door because they don't have the evidence record. Thank you. Any, but anything here? All right. Um, I'm going to allow this one more in the room, and then we're going to manage the clock. And, and noting, folks will have opportunity to submit additional written comment. We just need to manage the clock to make sure we get through everything. So, yes, sir. Very quickly, Glenn Kirsten. I think we need, I heard this, an education statewide about the social determinants of health. I go to mid and meetings, aging services, and I talk to members, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. Now, for example, the aging services have been working with ARC, who has uh, age-friendly communities, which address the exact same issues as the social determinants of health. But there's a whole group of population that talks about age-friendly age, uh, age communities. We need a, a broad education program on what, what social determinants of health mean. Thank you. And apologies, ma'am. Um, you did have opportunity on the first list, first go around. You did chair, correct? Okie dokie. We encourage you in the interest of time. We do need to move along. My apologies, Amanda. Thank you. So I'm going I'm going to pass it over to Will um, Clark Shim now um, to talk through the share initiative um, formula in the next portion of the will. So there's a handout that we provided today that I'll be walking through, generally speaking. Uh, but I'll also be providing some background along with reading the language from the proposed rule. So this is... Will, may I jump in for just a quick sec? This information was provided to RAC members by email last night. For those of you in the pu general public, either in the back of the room or on the phone, you will be able to find this content if you go to the public meeting calendar, hover over the meeting schedule for this this morning right now. Um, it will bring up a screen. I think if you move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, you will see one document there. That one document is actually a roll-up of these materials. So you may need to scroll through that. But we want to make sure you all have access to what's being discussed here. Thanks. Will, go ahead. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about the formula that drives the spending requirement for the SHARE initiative. In order to do that successfully, I think it might be helpful to have some background as to what goes into that formula. Uh, we provided you at the top of this handout a summary of the authority that leads to the SHARE initiative. We've got an excerpt from statute, and I'll read some parts from it. Uh, subparagraph B deals with the requirement for CCOs to maintain capital or surplus nece necessary to ensure the solvency of the CCO as specified by the authority and rule. That refers to the risk-based capital or RBC requirements that you'll see referenced in this rule that we're talking about today. Proposed rules for Senate Bill 1041, which led to this language, they're currently under development and they'll be dealt with separate racks. Uh, these rules, these RBC rules, they set out required levels of capital or surplus or net assets that CCOs must maintain and they specify actions to be taken if CCOs or OH, by CCOs or OHA if CCOs fall, fall below these thresholds. Uh, it's a complicated set of requirements. It's based on a model that's produced by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. CCOs input their financial information, such as net premiums and assets. And what comes out of the model is essentially a benchmark for how well funded a CCO is. And we can refer to that benchmark as 100% of RBC, or risk-based capital. 
For context, Senate Bill 1041 and the accompanying rule generally requires a minimum net assets of at least 200% of RVC in order to avoid the various actions that are laid out in that rule. So again, you can think of this as a measurement of how well funded a CCO is, and higher percents RVC means better funded. Turning back to the, um, the handout, subparagraph C from the statute reads in part, a CCO shall expend a portion of annual net income or reserves of the CCO that exceed the financial requirements specified in this paragraph, what I just talked about, on services designed to address social determinants of health. So subparagraph C is the authority for the spending requirement that is the share initiative formula we will be talking about and is spelled out in this rule. <coughs> However, before we jump into the rule language itself, I also want to lay the table in terms of some considerations that crossed our mind as we developed the rule. The language I just read you from the statutes, it's a relatively open mandate and we were left with a lot of room to fill in the blanks, as you may appreciate. So we tried to set some boundary markers for ourselves about what are we trying to accomplish with the formula that we do set up. The first boundary marker is that we are consistent with legislative intent. And in particular, the following goals that the funds applied to the SHARE initiative represent excess accumulated sur surplus of public funds, that assigning those funds won't meaningfully increase a CCO's likelihood of future insolvency or regulatory action, and consequently, that the SHARE initiative will not require any increase in CCO capitation rates on account of these requirements. Secondly, we want to make sure that this rule is logistically feasible, that CCOs can actually calculate the amount that they're going to have to put into the share initiative. And so um, while we welcome comments of, uh, 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 across the spectrum, com comments uh, addressing these points would be particularly informative. Is this formula as presented sufficient for CCOs to share, calculate their share requirement? And if not, what elements are missing or require clarification? So that's the background and foundation, and in the interest of time, I apologize if I'm fast-forwarding a little bit, but hopefully that's helpful to set context. <coughs> With that, we can jump into the specific language in the rule, which is shown on the back side of the handout. I'll read paragraphs 4A through 4D, and then pause for questions or comments, and then go into paragraph 4E and paragraph 2, the definition, which talk about adjusted net income, which is probably easier to handle as a separate topic. So starting with paragraphs 4A to 4D, which is essentially the, the spending rule formula itself, uh, the requirements for the share initiative are A, for each calendar year starting on or after January 1, 2021, CCO shall dedicate a portion of their previous calendar year's adjusted net income or reserves to SDOHE spending pursuant to et cetera. B, the portion of adjusted net income or reserve spent, as referenced above, shall equal or exceed the greater of the following two components. A, a percent of adjusted net income for the prior NERCAL year, calendar year, based on a sliding scale, based on contractors' RBC as of the end of that year, but prior to the share portion calculation. Or B, a proportion of the amount sent in dividends or payments to both shareholders, parents, parent companies, or other owners in that prior year. So A and B there, those capital A, capital B, that's the proposed formula to identify the minimum share initiative spending requirement. Next, uh, so paragraph C. Uh, the authority will provide specifications for cap A and cap B including the sliding scale in an initial reference document to CCOs by October 1, 2019, and publish any revisions for subsequent years, uh, each October 1st preceding those subsequent years. We have scheduled a separate meeting in September with CCOs to discuss these specifications or parameters, because the formula itself in rule does not have enough detail to calculate a dollars and cents amount. You need some additional parameters, those will come in a separate document, and those specific parameters will be discussed in that separate September meeting with CCOs. Those parameters, too, they may be updated annually. We wanted to have a little bit more flexibility as the rubber hits the road to adjust those parameters to the facts on the ground, whereas the rule structure itself, uh, the formula structure itself, we thought was better situated in rule. 
Finally, before breaking for comments and questions, the, in component A, there's effectively going to be a floor, percent of RBC floor, on that sliding scale. And so for purposes of the sliding scale, that floor will be the greater of 250% RBC or, more relevantly in a practical sense, percentage established in rule development for Senate Bill 1041 in relation to dividend payment restrictions. And that percentage on those separate proposed rules is 300% of RBC. And so what's happening there is above 300% RBC, CCOs are generally at liberty to send dividends to shareholders, parent companies, etc. But they also have share requirements, both components A and B, that apply. Below 300% RBC, OHA has uh, prior approval is required to pay dividends below 300% RBC, so OHA can restrict those dividends, but the amount of required share initiative funding below 300% RBC in those two components under component A is effectively zero because you're below the floor of the sliding scale. And for component B, which is based on dividends, if OHA says we don't believe that you have enough money to re responsibly pay those dividends, then of course you don't have any attendant share requirement attached to those dividends. So I know that's a lot of background and a lot of complexity in the rule, but hopefully I've helped set the table for a good discussion here. And with that, we'll open things up to questions and comments on the material discussed thus far. Can we just get by a show of hands who on the, in the building will want to speak? So I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five-ish. All right, uh, on the phone, can I get a sense of who will want to engage on this particular topic, just by name only? All right, uh, let us go in the other direction this time. So again, show of hands. All right, we will start. You've got it. Uh, Lucy with Trillium. I guess what my concern is the uh, share initiative um, seems to be have a foundation of excess accumulated surplus. And I have a concern about that because um, that could be very small. Could be very what? Sorry. Could be very small. I mean, and then, you know, we're hoping to do a lot of work with this. And, um, you know, I, I guess I had expected that there would be additional capitation. Okay. Well, um, there are a few factors at play here, and I may not be able to speak to them with the time given and with the resources at my disposal. So this is a little bit off the top of the head. In terms of dedicated funding for this, there are some constraints within our waiver about what can go into capitation rates. And part of what we're looking to do between um, various uh, programs, including performance-based reward, which is a separate topic, is find a way to fund health-related services and, and, and services that can address social determinants of health. But we are faced with some restrictions there. I acknowledge the point that the result of the share formula for someone, for a CCO that's just above, say, the sliding scale floor is going to be a small number. I think that's inevitable because otherwise, if you have a CCO who ever gets into the point where if I earn a dollar more, I'm going to trigger a $100,000 spending requirement, uh, that's going to be sort of a discontinuity that puts them in a very awkward position and they're going to try to avoid that. We wanted things rather to be smooth and for, for those share requirements to be smooth. Essentially, you've got to start from zero and you've got to increase incrementally from there. And so there could be challenges where certain CCOs have very, very small amount in certain years. We'd like to stress, though, that this is a minimum and that, you, that, doesn't, that doesn't stop CCOs from spending more. So if your requirement for a year is $3,000 and say you can't do anything with this, you can still think of a $50,000 program that might have had merit otherwise and that might have been under consideration otherwise, and that potentially can meet the requirement. I guess I just feel like it puts us into competition with things like HIT and other big initiatives that CCOs are also being asked to fund. Um, and so I guess I was hoping that that wouldn't be that easy. Thank you for that feedback. And I think um, just in terms of the interest of time and also um, the focus here at the RAC, 
this, just to emphasize what Will was saying, this is one piece of um, social determinants of health and equity spending, and this particular portion of the rule is really just focused on implementation of House Bill 4018, which is that piece that's focused on the excess income. All right, and we'll continue along this side. Everybody over here? Yes, sir. This is Colin from Cascading Project. Um, so I just had a couple of questions, not all of which might be entirely relevant, so pardon me for that. Um, my, my first question was, um, does any part of this rulemaking process include setting a maximum reserve limit for CCOs as far as how much they can have in reserve? You talk about a percentage of, but is there a, a ceiling of that? Um, my other thoughts or questions um, around <coughs> dividends sent to shareholders. Aren't members the shareholders in a CCO and the taxpayers of Oregon really considered shareholders in this? Um, and dividends would really just represent an overpayment by OHA. The reason I bring this up now is that this seems like it's really getting to um, a higher level of health equity and economic equity in in our world, and in our health systems. Um, and so that's the topic of what I wanted to bring up and have as my comment. Thank you for that. Shelly, if you'd like, sure. sure. You want Can to keep address them? the maximum? Sure. Uh, th I mean, there's effectively no maximum for how much assets a CCO can accumulate, although it's, you know, it, it, it would be challenging with everything that they're required to do under contract to just accumulate vast amounts of, of, of funds. And so as a practical matter, I think the highest CCOs might be in the ballpark of 500% RBC. But there's no maximum. Uh, but the higher the share formula at higher RBC levels, the harder it will be for CCOs to continue to go higher and higher in terms of their percent RBC. So while it won't necessarily impose a maximum, it'll start to impose a, a share requirement that makes it harder and harder to get to higher levels. In terms of, and so your second point of the question, uh, or second question, in terms of shareholders, uh, the CCOs could speak better this than I could, but there's a number of different structures amongst the CCOs, but ultimately they are, in many cases, owned by other entities, including, for example, such things as practi medical practitioners themselves or groups of medical practitioners. Um, and so, yes, there are owners. These, these are essentially private organizations. They are funded through public funds, thus all the public requirements, rules, et cetera, but they are privately held organizations in their essence. Thank you. Uh, we'll circle back, time permitting to you. Staying on this side, working around, Healthcare for All Oregon. Tom Sensick, Healthcare for All Oregon. I'm going back to the kind of the previous conversation is, and maybe it's caught somewhere else, the idea that this is surplus, extra, sounds out of line with where we're trying to go to improve the health of communities. And so that language itself throws me off uh, that we need to not think of this in terms of surplus. Then um, in particular, I want to comment about the, the B, that is the issue of dividends or payments to shareholders. And we know what we're talking about. We're talking about privately held stockholder-based companies that should not be getting our public dollars. Uh, and in fact, in SB 770, I want to go. It says that all these dollars should be held in the public trust. That's the direction the state has called for in SB 770, not to go to shareholders and dividend holders like that. The money needs to be going back to these services that will be represented by people at this table. So that's my comment. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And continuing around this side. Okay, I'd like to pause for a quick sec. Um, we only had one person um, identify themselves potentially for public comment on the phone. I want to make sure that person still wants to do that, which we, they're encouraged and welcome to do, but I need to affirm that right at this time. Is that Ms. Anderson, if I'm not mistaken? Are you on mute? I, I'd like to make a public comment. And this is your name? This is Sandy Sampson. Sandy Sampson. Thank not you. Anderson. Anderson. Thank you, Sandy. So what we're going to do is we've no, only had... Sampson, not Anderson. Sampson. <laughs> Sampson. I've got you. Thank you. Try to, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, can, hold on. Can the hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not opening for public comment. I'm just trying to determine how many people will like to speak so that we can manage the time efficiently. So I'm hearing there are two people. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. What I'm going to do in the interest of time is I am going to limit that to five minutes. You each will have two and a half minutes, beginning promptly at 11.55. I heard no one in the back of the room when I solicited for requests for public comment, so we will move forward with that. We have approximately 15 minutes to finish our agenda. If time permits, we will open for additional questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, I think... The, and I feel like you sort of raised this point, but the, this particular uh, provision of calculating the, the amount of money that CCOs are, are putting into this um, particular bucket area, what we've heard is that because that funding is sort of unpredictable, you're talking about you might have a grant making budget of $3,000 one year and the next year maybe it's 75000 And I think that speaks uh, even more towards the, the push towards the population policy level um, because episodic funding is a terrible way to deliver grant making for direct services. Um, it doesn't allow nonprofits to sort of scale and ramp up or to keep the, pr the, the provision of those services. So again, thinking about if we have kind of one-time only funds, uh, what's the best use of that? It, in our mind and our experience in grant making, that lends itself towards the systems change work, which supports, again, being explicit about a portion of that funding, being explicit about that funding going to systems change and policy. Thank you. This is Beth. Could I get on the queue? Yes, Beth, I think you are up, actually. Okay, um, thanks. I, um, I'm, I'm just curious. I, I heard someone, I think it was Amanda, say previously that this is just one piece of spending on um, social determinants of health. Where are the other pieces? What I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to piece together um, how much will, how much money will be spent on social determinants of health if, um, if one particular CCO or maybe both CCOs in a region don't have any excess, what's the right term? You know what I mean, the excess money. So I'm just wondering, are there, are, are we acknowledging that maybe certain areas of the state will just have no money spent on social determinants of health, or excuse me, no money required to be spent on social determinants of health if there isn't the excess money that the, um, that 4018 is, um, you know, asks us to make sure it gets put somewhere else? Thank you, Beth. And I'll try to answer as quickly as possible because I want to make sure we get through the rest of the rule. But um, what I meant there is that um, this particular part of the rule is just focused on implementing the legislative requirement through HB, 4, HB 4018, which is a requir that requirement to spend on um, the excess um, surplus excess income on social determinants of health. And so these... Um, when we're looking at these provisions, that's why we're really focused in that area. And I mean that there could be many other um, mechanisms that CCOs might use to fund social determinants of health spending. Health-related services is a much broader category than what we're talking about here um, and could include social determinants of health and equity. CCOs might have community benefit initiative spending depending on their structures. Um, and so um, we're just, what we're trying to do here is just focus in on um, the requirements that we've had to put forth related to um, the HB 4018 legislation. Um, and then I will briefly review um, another spending program um, shortly, but even these two are not the limitations on uh, CCO's um, social determinants of health and equity spending. All right, last call for questions by show of hands. I'm gonna go one, two, three, and then we're gonna go back to the team. So Robin. So uh, under E. Oh, can I um, finish my question? I was on the phone waiting. Oh. Is it, um, sure, go ahead. And this is? Sandy. Sandy, go ahead. This is Sandy. Yeah. So I just want clarification from the gentleman that was speaking in regards to the SB 41 financial reporting rules under SPA. So it says um, that... That the, that the adjusted net income is a pre-tax 
net income reported by the CCOs for calendar year or partial years relevant to the rule. And then it says modified by following items at the discretion of the authority. The authority, which authority are you, are you talking about? The OHA authority? And then those excessive um, administrative expenses, including management bonus and proper allocations of ex expenses across lines of business, non-operating revenues and expenses. Um, so how, so for the purpose of it, if you're just the adjusted net income for the purpose of part A of the proposed share initiative spending for a made described above, can you tell me what is the discretion? And then, so th so people can get all the bonuses and oh, adjusted to base data uh, made as part of the capitation rate development also, so. Sure, let me address that. And I think the other que one other question I heard just get started were about the remainder of the material in the handout. So let me walk through that and then we'll have a little bit more time for questions. Amanda still has some material as well too and we're running very close on time. Uh, so paragraph 4E from the rule says the authority's discretion in adjusting net income. So that's one of the components, one of the inputs to the formula component A that we talked about above. Uh, the, the OHA has discretion in adjusting net income, but we put, we've tried to make clear that here that the purpose, uh, for, that this will be for the purpose of ensuring that CCOs do not distribute net income to share stakeholders through other means than dividends or similar payments to owners to avoid share initiative spending. So that's the purpose of this adjusting and the adjusted net income definition. Separate thought, same paragraph, second sentence here. The authority's discretion may also extend to relief from share initiative requirements in the event of net assets outside the CCO's reasonable control that would otherwise place the CCO's capital in surplus or reserves below 200% RBC. So the, the second sentence there is something of a safety valve with the idea of tying back to legislative intent. This is not a, this is not a requirement to put CCOs in precarious financial positions, but rather take some money and reinvest it when there's been better than expected experience, essentially. Moving on to paragraph 2A, the definition of adjusted net income. That's the pre-tax net income reported by a CCO for a calendar year, um, modified by the following items at the discretion of the authority. Excessive, and, and so I want to be clear, we're going to start with the net income that CCOs report in their financials. Then we have the discretion to modify it for the purpose, I stated a minute ago, for the categories listed below. Excessive administrative expenses, including management bonuses. Improper allocation of expenses across lines of businesses. Non-operating revenues and expenses. Adjustments to base data made as part of capitation rate development. And other, ex other expenses not supported by legitimate business purposes, and payments or transfers to subcontractors, parent companies, affiliates, and subsidiaries. So uh, that's, that's, the def that's the definition. We've now read through it. Has that addressed, uh, I suppose we turn back to Sandy's question. Has that addressed your question, Sandy, or do you have any further follow-up on that? So, but so if there, so you said that um, there was no, uh, I don't know if it was you, but it, one of you said that if they exceed the 300 RBC, you have surplus excess of 300 RBC, are they still required to follow these guidelines or is this a discretionary of the um, Oregon Health Authority to make sure that none of A through F is occurring when they, you know, when you're starting to look at um, having that percentage or declaring a percentage to do this. So sure. I'm just, I just want clarification from you. If they're over 300% RBC for the year, then a portion of their adjusted net income needs to be fun, uh, becomes their share requirement for the next year, so to speak. And so, so if they're, if they're above that funded threshold using their balance sheet, you look at their net income for the year and you say, X percent of that, that dollar amount needs to be set aside as a share requirement for future years. The adjusted net income component of this or the factor is we just want to make sure that that net income amount 
that drives the share initiative requirement, that that is a number that we, OHA, feel is reasonable and is consistent with, the regulator with legislative intent and our regulatory authority. So it gives us some tools to make adjustments to the net income if we think that a CCO has tried to increase or reduce its net income by sending money, uh, by, dedica by dedicating additional money in a way that contravenes the intent of the rule. So could I, I just want one more, I just want one more clarification in regards to the um, metric pool for CCOs um, that were meeting metrics. There was $167 million in that pool that was going to be distributed, was it last year or this year, for, um, for, for payment. I know it's a different pot, but it's still a pot of money. So I'm just curious, is it, so those incentivized uh, monies, just goes to the CCOs. Is that inclusive into their net income or not? Sandy, I'm sorry. We're going to have to stick to this particular rule today, and we want to make sure we get through the last bit. So um, really appreciate your comments and would appreciate more um, written if you have them. What we're going to do now is I'm just going to read the very last paragraph of the rule, and then we're going to just do, try to do a quick um, take on everybody's quick, last comments. A quick round robin of last comments after that. We are mindful that we are going to be steadfast in our requirement that, that RAC member comment be submitted a week from today, close of business, so we do want to make sure that we have opportunity to at least get this out in front of you for discussion. So. Thank you. So the very last provision is related to um, the potential development of the build fund requirement, which is a separate social determinants of health and equity spending program, and it's dependent on availability of funds. The following requirements are specific to the build fund. Dependent on availability of funds under the Medicaid growth cap and within the authority's budget at the discretion of its director, the authority may require that CCOs spend a fixed portion of their income on social determinants of health and equity in compliance with all social determinants of health and equity spending program rules as set forth in this OAR in the contract between the CCO and the authority and in related guidance documents. So I think now we'll take any remaining comments on the share initiative spending formula and requirements and then any comments here as we can before we go to public comment. So by show of hands in the room. Okay, um, let us come over here and then we'll go to Healthcare for All Oregon. I think these folks might have got slated out of opportunity before, so I want to make sure we respect that. Sorry, this is Robin from UHA. Um, under the, outside of so under E there, outside of the CCO's reasonable control, um, it cannot be defined further, so what situations would be outside of the CCO's reasonable control? I'll, I, would, I, I don't know that we can define it further in the rule, uh, but to give you an example, for, let's say an epidemic, uh, something that drives up health care costs in a way that was not anticipated in the capitation rates that were provided to you. So like a pharmacy... Uh, a, a high cost pharmacy drugs, that's a little bit more of a gray area, newly approved by the FDA, but the, possibly. I, we really don't want to speak to specifics in the rule, but keep it open and a matter of open dialogue with the CCOs. Thank you. All right, Bill Busco. Um, so this is going up uh, to the, the big B. Um, the statement that says the percentage established in rural development for SB. Um, that seems like a really a clunky sentence. I don't know how it fits in here. And is there a rural development for 1041 someplace? It just, that just seemed like a really weird placement. Thank you for that comment. That's helpful. So, okay. And then, but my real question was, uh, is there going to be a related guidance document for um, that's described in 5A for the bill fund? Yes, um, there are. Di there's a, going to be a guidance document. A draft has already been um, shared with the CCOs related to contract sessions. And yeah. um, okay. Yeah. And staying on this side of the room, being yeah. brief, please. Marion, blank and um, Just quickly, I think that we'd like to recommend that the CCO <coughs> does exercise its uh, its discretion to adjust the ANI. Um, that there be some some kind of process built up around it that really enables CCOs to better understand, um, to look at worksheets or, or what, what this um, OHA is, is basing its decisions on and some uh, process for response. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you. comment. And continuing around the room. 
Yes, sir. Okay, so this last section is uh, really important, but I think that the idea that it should be social determinants of health are highly underfunded. And so why wouldn't basically all of the money that's left over be now be dumped or dumped, wrong word, uh, allocated to those kinds of things that are highly underfunded and never at the minimum amount given to shareholders, whatever is legally allowable, 0.01% or whatever that is, should be the consideration. These programs sitting at this table are highly underfunded and we need the money to go to them. And that's our position. All right. And we thank you for your comment. Continuing around the room. All right. Anyone on the phone, last chance on this before we move to public comment? Any RAC participants on the phone, last chance to offer input specific to this section that Will and Amanda have gone through. All right, I believe we had one individual, two individuals requesting to speak for public comment. Just as a matter of clarification, if you were a participant as a RAC member, um, you have contributed. We would not ask you to submit public comment. But the one individual on the phone, please state your name or two individuals rather, uh, we will allocate you each about two and a half minutes. This is Mary Williams. Thank you, Mary. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I would just like to note here that on the press release that OHA sent out for um, the, the RAC committee meetings that this specific meeting is um, designated for social determinants of health. And if we're going to dive so far into the interplay between um, 4018 as well as 1041, of, of which I was intimately involved in during the legislative session, then we really need to um, have the meeting mirror more the outline of um, August the 15th, where we're also discussing financial reporting, because really you can't have this conversation until all those financial rules are complete. Um, and so just, just an observation there, in order to have not only the public, but participants maybe better prepped um, for the intricacies of this issue. And thank you for that comment. You do still have a minute and a half if you wish to say additional. <laughs> That's okay. I, I wasn't ready with my notes. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe we had one other individual, and thank you for that. We appreciate. One other individual, please state your name. That may have been it. We will give one last chance to anyone in the back of the room that wishes to offer public comment. We can afford you about a minute and a half each. All right. We thank you all. Sincerely, everyone that participated and contributed today, um, the calendar is up on the website. I understand there may be a few issues with that that we will resolve and get up. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>